2022 Planning Commission meeting and Commission for Citizen Involvement meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Iris, would you please call the roll? Buchanan? Here. Keep? Here. Leak? Here. Pepe? Here. Phillips? Commissioner Phillips, you're muted if you want to unmute. Yep. Okay, I'm here. Thank you. Rigby? Yeah. Here. Stewart? Here. And Councillor Mance? Here. Thank you. Thank you. We have quorum. Uh, so first on our agenda tonight is a council update. Uh, again, uh, Councillor Mans will be giving us the council update. Uh, for those who may not uh, know, uh, Councillor Mans is our new uh, Council Plan Commission liaison. So uh, welcome, Councillor Mans, if you'd like to give us an update. I certainly would. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm honored to be with you folks. Uh, as far as the update is concerned, I'm sure you will let me know if I go on too long or if you want more detail. Uh, the council has had a productive couple of weeks. We um, have approved the skate park for Rashik, which uh, I know some folks have felt was kind of a controversial issue, but it is part of the act of recreation that has been uh, slated for that site for some time. Um, in addition to which we are moving forward with our IGA with the school district and the pool in that same area by the golf course or on the golf course. Uh, we have had a community survey, which may be of interest to you. And I apologize to Chair Heap. I was going to send him a link. I will go ahead and send a link to the survey to the entire planning commission. We came out quite favorably. This was done by a national firm and comparing our citizens' opinions of our city as a place to live, as a place to raise families, and the job that both our staff and, dare I say, the council is doing, uh, ranked very highly. I had nothing to do with uh, who they called and what was said, so I can say I was pleasantly surprised at, at the rankings. Um, other than that, I, I will leave it at that because I know you have a very full agenda tonight, Chair, but I will ask if there are any questions from the floor. Thank you, Councillor Manns. Commissioners, any questions for Councillor Manns? I don't see any, uh, so uh, thank Great. you, Councillor Manns. I will mute. I'm going to uh, be here for the entire meeting. If something comes up, please just uh, let me know in the chat room and I will try to answer the question to the best of my ability. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is item number four. This is public comment. This is regarding issues not on the agenda. Iris, was there anyone who wished to make a public comment tonight? No. We have uh, nobody that wishes to make a public comment. So. We'll move on for uh, no, item number five, Commission for Citizen Involvement, uh, general updates. Uh, I didn't have uh, any specific updates tonight. Uh, I will uh, mention though that uh, this last weekend I actually met with uh, Councilor Mounds and kind of debriefed on our goals, had a good discussion. And then the last meeting we had, I had mentioned that I had met with the Neighborhood uh, Coalition Commission uh, that's uh, forming. Uh, and I forgot to mention, there was two things that came both out of my uh, meetings uh, with the NCC as well as with Councilor Mance was uh, that um, both gave feedback that they thought it'd be extremely valuable to do the neighborhood tours like we had been doing, but we had pretty much paused uh, due to COVID. Uh, and so as we look at our 2022 goals, uh, and we look at uh, a number of issues that are facing us, uh, the feedback's been coming in fairly strong that, you know, they really like that model of doing the tours and getting out and actually seeing what's in the community and, um, you know, the stuff that we're working on. Uh, that's relevant. Yeah, so um, 
we'll work on that as it comes up over the next few weeks to see, uh, you know, I'll work with staff to see how we can try to phase that back in. But that's been uh, a really uh, positive um, uh, kind of activity that we've done in the past from the commission and a lot of recent feedback to say, let's continue on with it. All right, so that was it for commission for citizen involvement. I didn't know if any other commissioners had anything they wanted to say. No? All right, we'll move on to uh, item number six on the agenda. This is a public hearing. Uh, this is item 6.1 to 2021 annual community development code amendments, LU 21-0057. Uh, public testimony is accepted. Uh, one thing before we get started, I'll just mention uh, our agenda tonight is kind of packed. Uh, I'm not sure how it will go. I know last time we went uh, fairly long, so uh, maybe around 8 o'clock I'll check if anybody would like to take a break, then we can take a short break. If, if anybody if anybody would like to take a break prior to that, just let me know. Uh, so, uh, And then the other thing is, um, I'm not sure, like I said, I think our agenda could be fairly packed. So in general, I'll try to uh, stop the meeting uh, no later than 10 p.m. Uh, in case we go that long. And again, I'm not, I'm, I don't know that we'll go that long and I'm not trying to rush anything. I'm just trying to set some of the guidelines uh, for tonight. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll move into our first agenda item the 2021 Annual Community Development Code Amendments. Uh, again, this is a public hearing. Uh, Attorney Boone, is there any uh, preamble yes. you'd like to yeah, give Yeah, there us? is a preamble. Uh, read for the process. This is a legislative decision, which is generally a policy decision within the discretion of the City Council. The Planning Commission will review the legislative proposal and make a recommendation to the City Council. Although a legislative decision may be discretionary, it must also comply within the applicable state law as well as any applicable statewide planning goal or administrative rule adopted pursuant to ORS Chapter 197. A legislative amendment to the Community Development Code must also comply with any applicable provision of the Lake Oswego Comprehensive Plan. The public hearing process will begin with a presentation by staff and testimony will be received from the public. Individuals will be allowed up to five minutes. Recognized neighborhood associations, homeowner associations, government agencies, or other incorporated public interest organizations will be allowed up to 10 minutes. The time limits do not, apply, do not include time taken from questions from the commission or responses to those questions. Testimony by attorneys, representatives, and witnesses on behalf of which is part of the presentation by a person shall be counted within that person's time limit. Any person in attendance may cede his or her time for testimony to another person, except in no case shall the person's testimony be increased to greater than 10 minutes. At this point, I would ask the commission members to please declare if you have any financial conflicts of interest. And I'll start with Commissioner Lee. No, sir. Commissioner Rigby? No. No financial conflicts. Okay. Commissioner Stewart? Uh, none. 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 Uh, Mr. Phillips? No, I have none. All right. And uh, Mr. Pape? No conflicts. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Evan Franstead, Senior Planner with the Staff Report. Thank you, Mr. Boone and members of the Commission. Okay, so before us today is the um, Annual Code Amendment 2021. Here we are in the process. So we had a work session. The first one was on October 11th. Then we had the second one on, on November 22nd. And here we are at the public hearing. Um, if you make a decision tonight, the fines would be adopted February 14th, and it would go to the City Council public hearing on March 15th. As a refresher, so the first item, the first five, so there's 10 altogether, the first five are what we call maintenance amendments. The first one is to the building design standards for commercial industrial multifamily. This clarifies that buildings are required to be complementary to other structures of similar design and characteristics, such as commercial to commercial buildings or commercial to multifamily buildings, but not commercial to single family residential. Second item is, <clears throat> is deleting an obsolete code reference to 120 day extension that is not allowed by state law. So this would just delete it, make it clear that, that you cannot give the extension. <clears throat> Excuse me. Third item is um, clarifying existing setbacks for, setbacks from existing dwelling to an access lane. So when there's a partition and they're proposing an access lane, the code says that 
that excess lane has to be five feet from existing dwelling. This makes it clear that that is measured from, the five feet is measured from the edge of the 20 foot access easement. So the easement includes typically 12 feet of pavement and four feet of shoulders on both sides. That's the access lane, the, the private driveway. So that, that, that 20 feet has to be at least five feet from the existing dwelling. And this is just codifying existing practice that we already do, but making it clear, more clear. All right, item number four is to, is to fix conflicting minor variance standards. Code right now is not clear when you can exceed the 20% limitation. This will make it clear that if it is in order to save a tree, um, you are allowed to exceed the 20% 20, 20 of the yard setback if, it, if it's not resulting less than 50%. And finally, number, number five is the definition of family. This removes the maximum occupancy limit to the definition in compliance with House Bill 2583 that it became effective in, in January, January 1st. And on to the policy amendments. So the first one is an expansion of the hours for Saturday market type uses on Sunday. So the current code permits Saturday market type uses from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturdays and 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. on Sundays. The proposed code amendments would expand the hours on Sunday to start at an earlier time at 11 a.m. at the request of the Parks Department um, because they received positive feedback that an earlier start time would be better for the public and for, for the salary markets in general, but this would apply to all salary, salary market type uses, not just to, to the Lake Grove salary market, as we discussed in the work session in November. <clears throat> All right, item number two is the maximum size of boathouses and clarifying setbacks for, for boathouses. As I detailed in my memo that went out earlier today, we received two public comments since the staff report was published on December 20th. Those are exhibits G1 and G2. Um, the first G1 is a letter from Eves and G2 is a letter from Barman. Both of those letters discussed that um, well, they state concerns regarding the proposed amendments that will reduce the maximum size from 560 square feet to 500 square feet. Um, they state that the size of 500 square feet is insufficient to, to store a boat along with um, storage space for other items such as boat accessories, outdoor furniture, water toys, and yard equipment. So exhibits G1 and G2 are submitted in the record. Um, just to clarify, and as we stated in the, in the work sessions, the purpose of this amendment is to align with the Lake Corps sta private standards that limit bullet houses on Lake Corps property to 500 square, square feet. So this would align with that. It shouldn't matter where a bullet house is located, either on private property on, on, or on Lake property, the 500 square feet would, would be concurrent instead of having two different standards. This would make it e easier for everyone to implement. It also aligns with the floodplain management overlay amendments that you recently approved. Um, which has a, a boathouse variance if the boathouse is 500 square feet or less. So that's really the purpose of these is, is just to, for administration purposes, to make it easier for everybody and that it really doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter where a boathouse is located if it's either on private property or lake property, it should have the same standard of 500 square feet. And for the clarifying the, the side mirror setbacks, this is something that's already in the code it just makes it, put it in the table or right up front so anybody can see it and read it that bow houses don't have to, don't have to comply with side and, rear set, side and rear setbacks if they're within that 25 foot Lake Oswego setback. So as far as the bow house size, I, I uh, did a little research today, looked at the six most recent building permit applications. Some of these are under review still. Uh, what is the typical size of bow houses? Uh, so I have three examples for you. This first example shows just a boat slip with four foot of, of clearance on, I guess you would call the west side and five feet clearance on the south side, if you're looking at that from that direction. So you can walk around it in the door. So this proposal is 450 square feet. So with this, they would have 50 square feet extra to meet the, the maximum size of 500 as proposed for storage if they wanted to add that to it. So that, you know, it's five by 10. It's not very much space, but they could do it. Um, this just shows one configuration. There's there's number of configurations for these bow houses that I found. 
So here's example number two. It shows a boat slip with um, walking clearance on one side. So that's a four foot walkway around it and it has a small bathroom in there. So this is 350 square feet, just about a little bit less. It also has a covered outdoor area. Um, so this would allow an extra 150 square feet for additional storage if they so choose. Um, different configuration, just one way to do it. And here's the third example, which exceeds what our current code allows. This, is, this plan is under review, it's going to be revised. But this just shows one, a different plan. So it has the one boats, boat, boat slip, and then attached to it is a, a two room kind of storage area and a bathroom. This measures out at 572 square feet. So this would exceed what our current code allows at 560 and the proposed amendment 500. So that just gives you an idea of, of the size of these things and, and I guess the configuration. That's really my goal of showing it to you, just to help you visualize what, what we're talking about today. I should mention that all three of these examples are on lake property. So our current code doesn't apply. Um, that's pretty common. A lot of the lake properties are, the boathouses are on the lake, not on lake, private property. So you have private property and then you have additional land that's on the lake too. That's a lake core property where the zoning code doesn't apply. A lot of the boathouses that when doing a, a visual of the aerial along the lake are, the ones that are on private property are usually in the canals. Um, so just give an idea, an idea like this maximum size, this plan right here could be amended to lake core, pro, lake core specifications. I think they have an exception. Um, I was going to ask, does the Lake Corp um, give exceptions very easily? I, I, I'm not sure. Um, just in brief conversations with Jim Bateman of Lake Corp, I, I know they do have an exception. Uh, just like we do, we have a, a, a variance exception and we have a RID that's allowed for, for maximum size. So there, there are some exceptions available. But I'm not sure how often they, they grant those exceptions. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Francis, I might we might add that some of the properties, the the uh, shoreline is straddling, or the area where a boathouse might locate is straddling Lake Corp and individual private property. So there's that scenario that could arise too. Right. Yeah. Some boathouses are located on both. So you have one you have part on private property, part on the lake. In which case, they have to adhere to the. Our code or theirs? Um, right both. Now. Both. Yes. So that's one another good reason to have one um, one standard at 500 square feet. So if they wanted to go over 500 square feet, if we pass this uh, rules change, and they want to have it be larger, they will have to apply to both the Lake Corp and to the city for um, a variance. Is that accurate? Well, in that situation where it straddles, mm -hmm. yes, they would need approval from both. Thank you. Onerous. And there are other options too. As I mentioned in my memo, um, if people wanted additional storage, they could have an accessory structure, a detached structure that could not be located in a 25 foot setback. It had to be placed further in on a property. But that, there's other options available for storage. Real quick, is there a is there a currently like a height limit on these structures? Um, yes, there is a height limit. It's from the lake, um, the water. Is it 18 feet? I always forget what it is. 18. I think it's 18 and a half. Wow. Oh, 13 and a half. Wow. Sorry, <laughs> I need to look up the code. Yeah, it's a little different measurement. It's from the the water. Right. But yeah, 13 and a half up from the water for these. Can you, can you go to the uh, two earlier slides and show um, the boat slip spaces? This one, example number one? Example number one, I think. Yes, it should be hopefully up. 13 and a half. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they're for they're different configurations. Some are longer than the others. I guess it depends on what type of boat they're putting in there. Um, so they do all they come in different shapes and sizes, just like typical buildings. 
Yeah, it depends on what the, I guess the property owner is looking for. We do have a question from Vice Chair Pepe. Um, we, well, uh, Vice Chair Pepe. <clears throat> My apologies if, if this was uh, stated in a previous meeting and I have forgotten it. It's my understanding this is coming forward because of a um, dilemma that we're having with, uh, was it the floodplain? Is that correct? Well, that's that's one of the reasons to align with the, the recent um, floodplain amendments that included a, a, a variance to bow house size, which is 500 square feet if you want to apply for that variance. It has to be 500 square feet or less. Okay. And so that's where we're coming in with the 500 square foot uh, allowance, basically. Is that correct? Well, the floodplain and the lake core limitation of 500 as well. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Rigby. Um, just to, to clarify on that, is the 560 currently in conflict with, with the floodplain rules or how do those intersect? Well, so those are new amendments. Do you want answers? Well, yeah. The, the, the 560 has existed in the code, you know, for 10 years or 15, whenever it was put in. Uh, the 500 in the floodplain management is for the administrative variance, if you, if you can get an administrative floodplain variance if it's 500 square feet or below, okay? And that was adopted by the, by the Planning Commission and City Council about two months ago, okay, thing. Uh, so if it's above five, so if it, and the reason it was put in at 500 was sort of an anticipation of this, these amendments. So they, they dovetail together. Uh, however, that's also, um, considered the FEMA uh, policy to provide for small structures. So when we looked at what were small structures, uh, we, were, we looked at other, you know, at the typical boathouses around here and talked with FEMA about it. Um, and they were looking at basically single car garage style sizes. Uh, so small structures. So we settled on, on 500, a couple of reasons. Okay. But is, is the 25 foot setback area considered a floodplain? Not necessarily, no. Um, no, they're two, they're two different, they're two different standards. And, and really the, the discussion with FEMA during the floodplain review, floodplain management review, is that FEMA was insisting on a maximum accessory structure, boathouse structure size of 200 mm -hmm. square feet. And we said, well, wait a minute, we've got a whole community of boathouses and, and waterfront properties here that are quite a bit larger than that. And so through that discussion and deliberation with FEMA, they said, well, you know, the standard in the FEMA model code is 200 square feet. And, but I think they recognize that this is a, an unusual situation that we have here. And so we, they've acknowledged or they've accepted this variance process that we put in place, which is supposed to be uh, a clear and objective and over the counter type of approval for boat houses up to 500 square feet. So how did we get to 500 square feet? We consulted with the Lake Corporation and we made this determination based on the dimensions of a, a one car or a one, a one boat boathouse that this would be an appropriate standard. So that, that's, it was sort of, it was initiated through those floodplain management code updates and, but we need to make that complementary change to the development code um, for zoning purposes. So they're, they're two different things, but they were trying to get consistency. All right, just to clarify for me, if a, if a, an area within the 25 foot setback is also considered a floodplain, do the, the floodplain variance rules apply? Yes, if one is requesting a variance, those rules do apply. So in those cases, 500 is already effectively the maximum size? Yeah, right. yes, for the, yes, for the administrative variance. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Stewart, did you have another question? Yes, thank, thank you. Um, is there any um, is there any limitation to roof projections, um, overhangs, you know, the ability to build like trellis structures on the ends of these things, anything like that? Is that one that's 
Well, that, that's what sort of led me to the question is, is that, is there a limitation to how big something like that? Yeah, so you get the, the maximum height of 13 and a half feet from the water. Um, if they add, to, if they hang out onto the water, is that that's what you're asking? No, no. The, in the third example that you showed, there was an area to the left of the actual structure that was a, it appeared to be a projection of the roof that covered that sort of yeah, that heating is, area. Yeah, it's a covered area. I think that's a, a bar. So the question is, is is there a, a limit on the on the width of the overhang that you could build in a situation like that? Well. Not just for the overhang, overhang, but I mean, it does count as part of the footprint, which is gets back to the 500 square feet or 560. What I'm showing you here is just a configuration of, of the, the foundation area, I guess you could call it. But it, anything over 30 inches in height for our code would count Okay, so it would count as part of the, the maximum footprint. footage. Yeah, but as like I said before, all three of these examples are on Lake Corps property. Right. Um, okay, thank you. Shirley. Just one question. Um, so FEMA said, okay, 500 square feet, we can live with that. And if for some reason we don't pass it and we say, no, we're going to stay with 560, we're in trouble with FEMA, correct? <laughs> well, uh, not specifically. <laughs> and there, there, I said it, it's 500 square feet for the administrative variance. Okay? So over the counter, um, we've worked it out with FEMA, template findings, simple, okay? If, if, if a person wants to apply for, and if we allowed, more than 500 square feet, okay, either by our variance process, but they would also have to get a FEMA variance, then they would need to take on the burden of justifying it to FEMA directly. I uh, well, see. To, I mean, it's the application to us, okay? mm -hmm. but... Uh, it would not be under the administrative variance. So it would be a minor development, and we'd have to make findings on it. Um, so. quite, a, quite some hoots to jump through if you want to go over 500 feet. Yeah, and Commissioner Lake and Chair Heath, if I may, you may recall from the floodplain management amendments that another path that we had considered and we had actually explored with FEMA is what FEMA calls a community exception. And it's, it's basically a general permit or a variance for the, the jurisdiction for the city to exceed those maximum standards, in this case, 200 square feet. And when we pursued that, we were told, well, uh, there, there's, I think, only one other jurisdiction that was up in Puget Sound that had made a similar request. And the agency did not yet have the procedure in place to even uh, adjudicate or, or make a decision on that. So we, we would like to revisit that with FEMA, but, of course, that's not before... Um, the commission tonight, it, it is something that could potentially afford more flexibility than what we uh, believe that we have under those rules. Yeah. Well, Director Siegel, just to follow on your comment, make sure I understand that. Um, is that more, are you saying that there could be a general variation process that FEMA would use or put in place then? Uh, and uh, if we were going to get this general process in place, uh, that's what we're waiting to have. That's what people would be waiting to have defined by FEMA. Uh, or uh, is it? Are you just saying kind of blanketly that if uh, we were, if we went above the 500 square feet, then they would have to use the FEMA variation process, and that FEMA variation process is not defined yet. So people may be frustrated trying to go to FEMA when they don't have a process to find yet for that. Right, variation. yeah, that, that process is not for individual landowners, it's for jurisdictions, oh, yeah. local governments that would request that, that approval for their community. And then that, in that way, we may be able to elevate um, our allowed boathouse size, for example, but that opportunity doesn't yet exist. And so it's okay. not something that we can uh, promise or, uh, but we will continue to explore that. Okay, thank you. I see no further questions, if you wish to continue. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so the, the third um, policy-related item is uh, clarifying building design standards for multi-building sites. This, this clarifies that if there's a new building proposed on a, on a site with, that already includes existing buildings, that the design standards for Section 2 apply, which is to integrate 
uh, that building with the remaining buildings on site compared to requiring that new building to be complementary to adjacent buildings on adjacent sites. So the current code requires them to do both. The new building has to be complementary to other buildings on adjacent sites and to integrate with the remaining buildings on site, which can be a, a conflict. This makes it clear that the, the new building would have to integrate with the remaining buildings on site only. And as part of this, um, as my memo stated, we did receive, I received a com uh, well, questions from the Fair Housing Council of, of why the staff report did not address um, Oregon Planning Goal 10 for housing. And the reason why the staff report didn't, didn't address those standard, that Goal 10 is because it, it doesn't apply. Um, staff contends that frozen amendments to the design standards is what they were asking about, like th uh, this item right here. Um, they don't change density, they don't change uses, housing types, comprehensive plan, or zoning on any property. The amendments do not discourage construction of housing because the amendments are clarifying existing design standards that already apply. Um, there's no effect on the buildable lands inventory, therefore uh, Gold 10 is not applicable. And uh, on to number four. So this is for online neighborhood meetings. Um, during our COVID times here, we received positive comments from applicants that having online neighborhood meetings was beneficial, that they saw more people attend, is more accessible. So this code amendment allows an applicant of a land use application to hold an, a neighborhood meeting um, if the chair of that neighborhood, neighborhood association approves that. It just allows online neighborhood meetings where the current code does not. And last one, Item number five is for online public hearings. This is to comply with House Bill 2560. This will allow hybrid meetings. Um, it also would require the written submittal and signing up for the hearing the day of, which should be, is required by noon, and that written submittal, written testimony cannot be submitted at the hearing. Um, the reasons for this is it's difficult staff to, to perform um, to intake of materials as the hearing's going on and for commissioners to, to read those written materials when they're submitted in front of the, of, of the hearing body. Um, anyone can also request a, a mandatory continuance of an, of an evidentiary hearing, initial evidentiary hearing, sorry. Um, so they can always submit additional comments, written comments if they want to. Um, so this, this is a change, it's just, um, would allow a smoother operation during, during hearing, really. All right, so that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Commissioner's questions? Oh. Oh, Evan, on the previous one, uh, the uh, bottom note uh, said that uh, you could actually have a mandatory uh, continuance uh, if wanted to. Uh, if somebody wanted to uh, submit optional or more testimony, uh, they could they could ask for that continuance, and it wouldn't be negotiated by the presiding chair of the meeting. Uh, it would be mandatory that would have to be offered. Yeah, that's correct. It's in our code now, so someone can show up and, and say uh, we request a, a continuance, and and we have to grant it. Oh, but I, maybe I'm misunderstanding them I in mean, some of the more recent meetings I've seen, especially like in the council meetings where they've held their hearings, uh, you know, they've asked for a continuance and it's actually the chair or the president, the mayor who's presiding and they can basically determine whether they want that continuance or not. Uh, but, yes. Uh, that, uh, this applies to, to, to applications. Right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the instance in which you, refer, you referenced was a legislative proposal. And this, this follows state statute, which, which, applies, to, uh, which applies to quasi judicial applications. And so, under state statute, a person has a right to require the continuance to the initial evidentiary hearing. So anything that goes with the other thing is anything that goes to the city council is not the initial evidentiary hearing. Under our code uh, on appeal or to the city council, 
The materials are already in the record. No new materials may be submitted uh, with certain limited exceptions. So there isn't an, isn't an opportunity to submit new stuff because there's no, they're not responding to new material anyway. So. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, commissioners, any other questions? None? All right, well, I'd like to uh, open it up for uh, public testimony. Uh, Evan, is there anything in addition we need to state for uh, no. public testimony? None. Uh, Iris, would you like to call uh, anyone, the first person who would like to give public testimony? Mr. Mark Eves. Yeah, please come to the podium there and state your name and address for the record, please. Uh, and also any organization you may represent. Uh, I have to keep the mask on? Yes. Oh, a little hard to hear. My name is Mark Eves, spelled E-V-E-S. I don't represent any organization. I live at 237 North Shore Road. And I have a conflict of interest, unlike you. See, I live on the lake. I've been there for 35 years. Uh, I'd like to, to uh, have us remember what this lake is about. There are people who have boathouses that are down a very steep bank, and they need a bathroom and other things because it's such a huge trip. And others have a small lot like mine and a boathouse built in the 30s that needs to be expanded, if no other reason, just to keep out of the weather. But I would like to talk to you about the floodplain because I was president of the Lake Corporation back around the time of the flood or just after. We modified the head gate, we modified the main dam, so we reduced the height of the floodplain from around 103 feet to 100 feet. So the vast majority of the uh, boathouses that we're talking about, or boat garages, are not in the floodplain. We're talking, that's just a very tiny percentage. So don't be steered by, by that, because the vast majority of the houses on the lake are not in the floodplain, just a small number. So I hope you won't be steered by that. The important thing from my perspective is that there's so much variety of, of styles of houses and sizes of yards, and I agree with your conclusion that, that we, it's in a way sort of silly to make a distinction between whether it's lake corporation property or private property. We should have roughly the same standards. But what's happened over the years, back when I was president of the Lake Corporation and, and before that and since, is the Lake Corporation has had the ability to look at the whole situation, look at where the house is and, and, the, and the position and the effect of the neighbors, and they've been able to allow the circumstances to steer the, the style and type of a boathouse. One of the big problems that you we run into is what is a boathouse or a boat garage? When you live on a small postage stamp of a lot, your deck and that garage for the boat are really, where does one start and the other stop? They, this is an artificial distinction. This is not a garage. And so my suggestion is that this, you, you are addressing a problem that isn't a problem. It isn't broken, you don't need to fix it. The Lake Corporation has done a pretty darn good job over the years sizing up the huge variety of circumstances that exist. Let them continue, let them continue. My suggestion would be get rid of the 560 foot standard, get the city out of this business of regulating this, you know, potential for lawsuits and bad feelings and stuff. But it, it either keep it the same or get rid of the 560. But it, the, the floodplain issue is not an issue, except for a very small number of houses, and you know that. And so my suggestion is this, is, this, this one isn't broken. You don't need to fix it. So let it be, and the Lake Corporation can continue to do a good job of judging circumstances as they exist with a huge variety of terrain differences and shoreline differences. And by the way, from the perspective of somebody who spent many years working on nonprofit entities, I'd like to say thanks to you guys for volunteering, because I know how much time it takes. And that's all. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any questions for Mr. Reeves? Commissioner Buchanan, go ahead. Yeah, from your experience, I'd like to hear you talk more about the floodplain issue with the lowering of the lake. Yeah, what happened was that I was on the board at that time. We have lots of stories of flood stories, you know. 
I was working over the dam uh, when all the, the debris was flowing through. We were literally with chainsaws in the water, standing on that metal scaffolding, trying to chop things up so they could come through. So uh, what we did is modified the main dam so we could evacuate water faster. And we modified the head gate. The head gate is the small dam that separates the Tualatin River from the canal. So we modified both, and we were successful then with FEMA saying, all right, the floodplain is no longer 100, the floodplain is, is lower, so we have less of a problem. And we did that at a huge expense. By the way, taxpayer expense is zero. We paid for it. Uh, and so what it did is, you, some of you may remember that, that State Street was underwater uh, during that flood. Yeah, yeah. Well, it won't happen again because of what we did to modify the head gate and modify the main dam. We can move that water where that won't happen again. Yeah, but we've, we now can move so much more water uh, than, we, than we could before. Um, and so you really don't have a problem here. And so my suggestion is don't do anything. Just either, I, my preference would be get rid of the 560, get rid of it altogether, and let this be a late corporation issue. But as long as you have it, at least stay there. And so for silly people like me who have a little 1930s boat garage and a cheap plastic building I put next to it to hold the lawnmower. There isn't room to put it anyplace else. Let me expand my boathouse a little bit so I can at least park a, the lawnmower in an attractive area. Because the way it is now, with, with uh, some modest changes I'd like to make to mine, I wouldn't even be permitted to do it. So if we don't have a problem that needs fixing. Please don't fix it. Uh, Commissioner Rigby. Um, you mentioned your own situation in your uh, testimony here. Um, you, how large is your boathouse? I don't know the exact, I haven't measured it. But I, I took a guess at it that was around, it was around, oh, I think around 400 as it currently sits. Now, I'm 72 years old, and so the, the, it was there when I bought the house 35 years ago. So it's real skinny, by the way. Uh, I don't know if you know John Burdick. Don Burdick is a, uh, he said, look at my new old boat. His, his slip was so small, the new boats couldn't even fit in there. So he took his old boat and re refurbished the 40 year old boat so it could fit within the concrete walls. And mine is a very similar situation. Um, and so uh, what I'd like to do is just go back a little bit with this cheap plastic building I bought at a charity auction, get rid of that and have something more attractive. And then maybe even have a, a little bit of a lean-to. I have a rowboat that I'd like to be able to have under cover. Right now, I have to pull it out of the water, flip it over up, upside down. And my wife also is 72, and she can't do that. So we'd like to be able to have it just sitting upright under a lean-to so we can row the boat. Well, the reason I ask, uh, Mr. Eaves, is because you know, we were presented with a couple of plans of potential boat houses, and it looked like, I, I recall one being uh, 400 something feet, and it seemed to have, to have storage as well. So. Um, well, I invite you to come and visit my house. I invite you to come and see. Thank you, Commissioner Rugby. Commissioner Lee. Um, so, Mr. Eve, so is your property in a floodplain or no? No. And you stated that there's a small number of properties that are in the floodplain. Yeah. How, how many are there? I don't know. To the best of my knowledge, they're, uh, I, I think they're on the canal, one of the canals, uh, but not on the main lake because of the way we modified the dam. So, so you're not sure how many there are, but and would those, do you think those people would care about kind of the process they had to go through if they had to go through a more cumbersome process working directly with FEMA rather than, you know, having an over-the-counter process that we heard from staff, you think those people would not be impacted or care? Well, they already are uh, impacted. 
because they're on, on a floodplain. What happened was that when FEMA came back and said, well, this is the new standard for a 100-year flood, they said, OK, that means that uh, all of the houses essentially on Lakewood Bay where I live, or the main lake, are essentially, or these parts of them down by the water within a floodplain. What that meant was that every single one of those houses had to have flood insurance, FEMA flood insurance. I don't know if you checked lately to see how much that costs. It's enormously expensive. So we took a look at that. We talked to FEMA at the time, and we modified the dam and the head gate with their full knowledge and participation. And as a result of that, the floodplain was changed so that, so that these houses would not have to purchase flood insurance in order to get a mortgage. That's a big deal. And I realized that they said there's some that they just can't do anything about. But that's already is what it is. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioners, uh, Vice Chair Pepe. Yes, Mr. Eves, um, help me understand, is there anything precluding those that have lakefront easement, whether in, a, in the canal and or on the main lake, from simply mooring their boat in front of their property without a boathouse, a simple dock? Uh, you'd have to check the, the current Lake, uh, Lake Corp requirements. From a practical standpoint, uh, Oswego Lake is different from other lakes in that it doesn't have a gradual shoreline that has seawalls. Uh, so if you, if you were to tie a boat up to a seawall, it would be beaten to pieces in, day, in days with waves, except possibly in the canals where there's not so much wave action. I can't tie my boat up to the front of my dock there on, uh, 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 along the seawall because of the wave action, which beat it, beat it to death. So you're asking, uh, could boats be just uh, out there in the lake? I suppose theoretically they could be. They'd be out in the weather. Uh, we have a number of lovely wooden boats, uh, classic boats that are, need to be kept under cover. But if you want them all to set outside in the weather, I suppose that's your judgment. We, we would disagree with that. I was merely asking that question based on the, the different um, oh, uh, park associations that have um, docks where those that don't necessarily live on the lake but have access to uh, the lake moor their boats at a dock. Yeah, yeah. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Well, that doesn't happen on Oswego Lake. Maybe, oh, you're talking about easements maybe? Is that what you're referring to? Right. Uh-huh. Yeah, we have easements where they people do tie their boats up and they put covers on, and the others, right. the, the, those are the people don't who don't do not own lakefront property. So, okay, when they developed this this and area, their their easement rights were given, as you know, for non lakefront lots, and but for, we're, we're, our subject here is lakefront properties. Right, and I, while you were president of the uh, or, or or a member of the uh, Lake Corps Association. Were there any issues with those that moored their boats that had the access to those uh, easements and, and moored their boats at, at one of those docks? I don't know what you mean by were there any issues. Could you explain? Well, you, you, were, you were saying that they would get beaten to, to shreds, and I, I guess I wasn't aware of that being an issue. Well, uh, in the easement areas, they are located in, in protective coves and things where they are... Uh, they're more protected from, from that. But it is a, a problem in every one of them. Uh, you can just hear people howl when somebody drives their boat past, fast, past an easement, because the boats go bouncing all over the place. And so it's, it, that's always been an issue. People have been ticketed for, for that, if that's what you're referring to. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, there's, there's a, a, a New kind of not, not old kind of boat that's becoming popular for old kind of people like me, I guess. There are kind of pontoon boats. You've seen them, party boats or whatever they call them. Um, they are huge, 22 feet long, maybe as much as I don't know, 10 feet wide. And either they sit out in the in the weather, or they're going to be in a boathouse. But you have to remember, there's all kinds of boats, including those. So how are you going to have a boathouse that's going to have a, a Availability of people to get on and off and safely bring it in and out for one of those. If you have your limits, I suggest that you can't. 
So, so the solution here is so many variables. And what is a boathouse, what is not a boathouse, is let the lake corporation deal with this. They've done a pretty darn good job over many years. I don't know if the city needs to put its oar in this water. Yeah, Commissioner Lee. I had a comment um, uh, in relation to what Commissioner Pape was asking regarding boat slips. In the easement, sometimes they're actually slips, so they can be tied off on both sides with um, buffers on both sides, so that as they move with the wave action, they're not being smashed against a dock. Whereas in the canals and, and other um, lake properties, there, there's no room for a boat slip to pull into and to tie off on the stern and the bow. Um, but I have seen on some of the lakes, instead of having a boathouse um, parked parallel to the, to the property line and with a boat hoist that hoisted it right out of the water so that it wouldn't have that wave action against it. So there are ways to do that without having a structure. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, and we have boat hoists on the lake. There are some, a handful. But the, the, going back to the history of developing this area, when it was developed, it was, it was by and large developed where the lots carved in slots where they could house their boats and also store their, their uh, outdoor furniture and, and store the lawnmower and do other stuff out, uh, out there. That's just the way this, this community has developed. Yes, there, there are a handful of hoists that do that. And, and if they have a, a top on, they, the, the, the sun and weather beats them up pretty fast. You have to replace the canvas mm -hmm. top pretty often and stuff. So my but, question then to planning is, and if we were to just abdicate and say we're not going to have a standard for boathouse size and we'll just let the lake court deal with it, how do you perceive that as being an issue or a problem? Well, we have standards for accessory structures and boathouses are a type of accessory structure. Okay. Uh, the, the standards, the code requires that you meet setbacks for those accessory structures. And so the code has exceptions for certain things and boathouses are one of those things that are allowed within the Oswego Lake, lake setbacks. So there, there are setbacks from the lake that are based on the property line of, of the lot, not the lake core property, which would be in the lake or, or toward the lake. Um, you know, setback standards are whether it's a lakefront property or in, inside the city, interior of the city, uh, they're for separation, light, air, uh, a sense of some open area space between structures. So yet the city didn't regulate that and just abdicated, as you said, to um, a private entity. Uh, you know, would the public interest be compromised there? Perhaps, maybe, maybe not. I mean, that's a policy issue for, for the commission to consider. Um, so I, I don't know if uh, either Planner Francis or Mr. Boone would have anything to add on that legal or policy side of uh, your question. I did want to go back to the comment uh, earlier about boathouses being out of the floodplain, and we we have we do review um, you know routinely remodels and repairs and additions and replacements of boathouses and uh, creation of you know these slips and modifications of the seawall and uh, you know pile, piles that go into the lake bed in order to create these structures or to replace them. And so that development, when it is below that elevation, 100.7 or whatever that, that lake elevation is now, uh, that development is in the flood plain or the flood, flood way. And so that does require review under the flood management regulations. So I just wanted to clarify that, but I, I don't want to inter interfere with the testimony. No, and no, let me just say it. that there's a big difference in flood way and a flood plain under FEMA rules, right. as you are well aware. And by the way, also, as to the setbacks, remember this, if you go look at the lake or drive around, I challenge you to find, well, I guess I can think of a handful, but almost all boat garages are on the lot line. In my case, the uh, uh, Mine is right on the lot line, and then the, the boat garage right next to me, Judge Reiselberg's, is on his lot line. So they're not set back, they're right on the lot line. Right. 
That's why the code provides that exception. So I, I'm not going to get into it. I guess I'm also and part of my property is, is Lake Corp on the front, and part of it is my own. I'm curious why the Lake Corporation isn't here testifying what their stance on this is. I haven't spoken with them about it. I hired I Jeff Ward. I would think if they had an manager. issue with this, they would be before us. Well, maybe because they don't think it's that big of a deal. They're kind of hoping you drop it. I know that's what I'd hope like you to do. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Commissioners, any other questions? I see none. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Iris, uh, would you like to call the next person? Mr. Bob Barman. Bob Barman, 1445 Oak Terrace. First of all, thank you for your service and what a gorgeous new building we have here. I'm not going to be redundant, but I, I want to give a little nuance to this. I have clean hands. My vote garage has been permitted. I'm not going to be back here, so this has nothing to do with me personally. I served on the Lake Corporation for 10 years, with most of the time with Mark, nine of it as chair of development. I authorized and approved well over 100 boat garages. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of homes. And what I learned right off the bat is you can't look at one home the same. You've got the cabanas that are different than Lakewood Bay, that are different than the smaller lots on Blue Heron or West Bay. You have homes off of South Shore that come down on trams down. And they, they're they known as, honey, I forgot the mustard. Go get the mustard, honey. I've got to go to the bathroom. I can't go to the bathroom. Some have pumped up toilets. Some flat land like, like Lakewood Bay, no need. My house, come on in. We've had every year, you're all, everyone's welcome. My, bells, my wife can't hear this. They come over to use our restroom because they can't make it around and get back to their houses up and down. So I want to show you this map because this map illustrates for you guys the issue. This is your lake setback then, but it's missing two points. My home would be an example, and again, it's not my home. I own 25 feet into the lake all the way around. I don't need the Lake Corporation stamp to get my boat garage because the Lake Corporation is a private entity that doesn't regulate my personal property. So in my case, I have a 700 square foot, or I did, a 700 square foot boat garage built by the original builder in 1984, not Bob Barman. So what you'd be doing here is affecting my personal property, not the Lake Corp. So that's one issue. The cabanas would be another example for you, or many hundreds of homes literally would can build their entire boat garage in that setback area. So whether they want, if you look at the map I sent you, if this was all on my property and I'm going further into my property, I don't go to the Lake Corp. I've, I've checked this with the city attorney because he said, Bob, you don't have to have a stamp if it's all on your property because the Lake Corp's not a governmental agency. Now, if this was on Lake Corp property, they control it, and they do. So they, they don't even get to you at 560 or if they don't give a variance. It never can be approved because if you can't get a, a, a building permit without the Lake Corp stamp on their property. So that's why I say this is sort of a non-entity. Lake Corp doesn't approve it on theirs, 500. Now why do they have 500? 500 is a good number. It works pretty much, especially in the canals, but there are variances and they have the ability to go up through their board, through their permitting, but the 560 can only occur on my property, on mine, if I want to give it up or I have it. I was on the school board for eight years. I was known as Mr. Disability. I care deeply about kids who have learning issues. I care deeply about elders, my neighbors, my dad at 96. You need at least three feet for an elder to, or many of the, my friends who have disabilities with kids. I have to have a platform. I can't have one foot on one side and two feet on the other side and expect to get someone in there. You need, in, me, in most cases today, to be able to get into all sides, if you can. Issue about, issue about easements. Easements have many issues, and one of them is they put in lifts. They 
many, we now authorized lifts, they're all over because of the rocking of the water. Next thing, why don't you just have the boat out on the main lake? If you had the boat on the main lake, including mine, you would have a, your, your boat would, wouldn't make it. You would have to put on whips. Then how do you have friends over? And I like to have a party all the time. So I want to have at least one or two tie up. So if you have your boat garage in here and you only have 70 feet, that boat is sitting right out there. So you need to keep accessibility. So I love the Lake Corp called them. 30 seconds. They, in closing, this isn't about the Lake Corp. It's about you allowing us on our personal property outside of the FEMA, the few FEMA properties there, to continue on as is. And last, last thing, you can get a RID for an 800 square foot boat garage. And you're not shutting that down. You go through the RID, you can go 800 feet or up to 18 feet in height. So this is sort of like a moderate, moderate step. Fine. Did I go my five minutes? Yes, continue on until the chair, you know, oh, okay. down. But the, the, and I'm not, I, I sat on the committee that designed the 800. It would have to go through a variance, the 18 feet through a variance, the 560 to give people high or low a little difference, different kind of style, 13 and a half foot maximum. 13.5 maximum height. We give some flexibility. Mostly we want the flat roofs at 10. You can go to 12 or 13, exception. Lake Corp stamps it. You got to go to your neighbor on the right, the neighbor on the left, and everyone says kumbaya. If the neighbor doesn't say, guess what, it's 10. Um, if the neighbor doesn't want the extra 60. And the last thing is, no, we're look at all the toys. When I first first here, the boats were 19 feet and about eight feet wide. Now they're all 10 feet wide. They're 22, I gave you the Oswego. In fact, it's called the Oswego Mastercraft. I don't know, my kids want me to get one. I'm not getting one, but uh, it's 22 feet with a platform. You gotta cover it. What do you do with all these crazy things? Uh, 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 weight, not just wakeboards, those uh, paddle boards. We didn't have any of those in the 90s. And so they're supposed to sit out in the yard. So it gives people as they're rebuilding and they're spending the money. And these boat garages cost a fortune, folks. They're several hundred thousand dollars now to get the engineering. And so to put all that stuff in there, you, you don't want to have your, your t call it your toys outside. Uh, you just don't. And when I saw that person build that small boathouse, that's a very expensive error because we're all going to eventually sell our homes. We just. The good Lord's going to take us all at some point. And the next person's going to come in here, and by and large, guess what? They're going to want the 22-foot boat. And the Lake Corporation limits it, thank God, to 22. We don't have 28, 92. It's very, you know, that's what we are, 22 feet. So I hope you understand my overarching thing is you've got a great policy. You've got a great Lake Corp, uh, Lake Corp saying, um, yes or no, working with the neighbors. You have the flexibility now on the private property to say, okay, Bob Barman, if you want to eat into your yard or eat into your house, you can fit the 560, not anymore. If you want to go 800, Mr. Barman, you're going to have to go to the RID, notify all 300 people. So it's well, one well, Mr. Barman, later. I think we got your point if you okay. want we'll Sorry. Call time here, we'll ask the commissioners for any more questions. Okay. Uh, commissioners, questions for Mr. Barman? Mr. Rigby. Um, well, we heard from from staff, um, you know, in the previous testimony, uh, you're talking a little bit about um, you're making the distinction, of course, between, you know, on Lake Court property versus on your own private property. And the setback uh, was mentioned as being for the, the common benefit for, uh, you know, the open air for having an open shoreline on the lake for creating an appearance of openness. Um, do you think that um, the size of the boathouse has an effect on that feeling of openness and do you think that that's important? I, I'm absolutely a proponent of uh, sight lines. In fact, we sat down and, and specifically in a combination working with the city planning department at that time, limited to things. Uh, pool that's below ground, chimney lower than six feet, barbecue lower than what four feet, 
No exceptions for ADUs. All these things are for sight lines, so it's very important. A boat garage, we also limited to 13 feet. So the only thing we're talking here is we're not talking higher to block a neighbor's view because you can have a hedge already over the 13 feet. We're talking letting it extend further. In my illustration, it would be 60 feet. If it's 10 feet wide, you're talking six feet deeper. So we're not we're we're talking we're not talking huge differences, but we're talking enough for a bathroom or enough for to store some a little additional besides the walk around current boat. So, uh, yes, I hope that answers your question. So, the six you think the sixty foot difference uh, does not make a difference in no, not in not in the aspect. scale or sense, and it's not going to be everyone's going to have five sixty. So you're at five sixty. Different people have different needs. If you're off of, like I said, off of South Shore or off of Summit, and you're coming down, you you don't want to haul up all your toys every time if you don't have a place to put them in a secure area. So my house, uh, my neighbors, no. My four neighbors on Robinson Point, um, no. They they have other storage, so they have smaller needs. So it, it's not one size fits all. And just looking at your, your diagram here, this in the boat houses that I have had occasion to be in to see, um, the entrance onto the boat has been directly from outside the boathouse. It has been open a door and then step onto the boat. And the other wall of the boathouse has been the edge of the slip. There's been no, no walk around. It's just been the slip. And then there is a separate storage compartment. Um, it, is there, what, you know, what, what caused you to, to draw it like this? Am, am I not understanding oh, the I aspect think, of this? Uh, uh, there are some lean-to places that, that, that open straight up there. That would be a more an older version. I would say the vast majority are some form of here. They have a wall all the way around. They have a garage door in the front of some, of some sort. Uh, it's not showing an elevation of 10 feet. Remember, this is my kindergarten sketch. Uh, probably the biggest difference here versus, and you saw it there, to fit in and to have any storage, you have to push one side all the way over and you can't walk around in, in, in the one illustration. But then to have a three foot walk around, you can't have storage in the front either. And I don't have a toilet or anything in here. This is 480. Uh, the other thing is this illustration here is showing the typical boat now on this lake. And the typical boat is the Mastercraft, whether, whether it's the pontoon at 22 or the Mastercraft at 20 with, a, with the platform of 2 of 24. That's, that's been the, uh, the typical boat here, I would say, for the last 20 years. Now, when you go 30 years ago, it wasn't. It was the 19-foot Sea Ray. They didn't do wakeboarding, so they didn't have all that. But it's, the use of the lake, has, for anyone who's been on there, has completely changed. It's water skiing's out. No, almost no one water skis. They all either wakeboard, wake surf. And so those are different kind of boats and different kind of widths. And then the pontoon boat, like Mark said, is become, where they were non-existent 10 years ago. I would say there's uh, dozens of them and growing. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that eats into uh, your typical older style Marquis original boat garage. So are, do the walkways help with, with that storage? I'm just wondering, uh, well, this you know, is eliminating the walkways as I've seen done, of course, creates more room for storage. So is, is there a, a downside to doing that? What, is there a reason why someone wouldn't want to do that? I, I believe if you have a door to cover this thing and you have a door to get in, you need a concrete walkway or something to get around. The boat is sitting in the well and getting lifted up. In this, in this illustration, and I'm not saying this is the only one or an architect couldn't come in here. In this one, there's no storage, none. There's no room. But a typical ADA walkway, ADA is 36 inches is on the tiniest spot. So if I take my dad or my stepmom or heck myself, I'm 64. I don't want to walk on a one or foot, a one or two foot. When I was young, it didn't bother me at all. But 
having the water there and, and the boat, it, they need some space, especially if this is a wall. Uh, and you need to get your, your stuff in a garage if you want to maintain it because having it sit outside, even if it wasn't stolen, it just gets um, run down. Um, all these things get run down quicker if they're not in the elements, whether it's the summer heat or the winter ice or whatever. Thank you. I hope that helps. Yeah. Commissioner Stewart. You, you, start, you started down this thought process a little bit, but I wanted to ask the question, have you ever had to accommodate a guest um, or a friend or something onto your boat in a wheelchair? I have had, uh, actually, yes, I, as a last wish of a very dear friend of ours. She passed away. It took three, three of us to get her in the boat, and that was her dream. Um, I've had many, uh, my dad is 96, like I've said, and every summer he wants to go out there with Pat, my stepmom, uh, and it's an effort, but we get them in. Uh, I have uh, several friends on this lake, uh, we have several people on this lake in their 90s and they switch to a pontoon boat because the pontoon boat, you can open up the site and they get in. Uh, we had uh, the blizzards, I don't know if you know Christy Blizzard, is it severely, disabled child who lived for uh, decades on uh, West Bay and every weekend her mom would take, uh, excuse me, it's Stephanie Blizzard, her mom Christy would take her out in her full wheelchair with her aid. Uh, so yeah, there's, it's amazing how much love and comfort it gives to someone who has such a small uh, opportunity to be given the opportunity to go out and enjoy uh, that experience. And I didn't think I'd be asked this, but it was very emotional when she passed away, that that was her last wish to be on our lake. Yeah, the reason, the reason I, I, I bring that up is, you know, this is a very obviously complicated discussion, but the, the thing that I'm, I'm sort of falling back on is, you know, I, my fear in, in proposing to make these things smaller is, is that issue. It's the, you know, does it still, can it still be accessible, right? And so that's- it, if, you, if you were there with me uh, and you saw Stephanie, the joy, her mom brought her and her dad in the pontoon boat just going around It, it would bring tears to your eyes. And having that boat garage that you saw there with one or two feet in, in their case, and that would be a variance case, I guarantee you, with the Lake Corp. But there's several of them like that. All right, thank you, Mr. Berman. I see no further questions from any of the commissioners, so thank you for your testimony tonight. I, I have a what? comment, actually. Um, you know, in, in line with what Commissioner Stewart is, is referencing, um, clearly having somebody in a wheelchair on this kind of configuration, pretty sketchy situation. Uh, and I would think that at the front of the boat, you know, maybe have a triangular shape, which allows you to round that corner. But even still, like three feet is a very narrow passageway. And like you said, the most narrow you would have in an ADA compliant situation. So the danger with water is just really frightening, especially for somebody in that situation. Uh, you're right. I worry deeply about my dad, who's at Mary's Woods, who has memory issues going in. Uh, he, they're already, if you've seen, they're already a little worried about their walk. And so you have to put it against that versus safety versus a lot of stuff. And so I'm not judging other people. I'm just trying to answer Commissioner Stewart's question. There are a lot of people who have uh, different needs with different um, 
relatives, friends, community people just, and then they try and accommodate them the best they can. In this illustration, the extra 60 feet, if I had a, if I, if I fit in that criteria, I could widen one side and make sure I had the room for accessibility. I could lower my pontoon boat uh, and put in, there's a kind of lift that has wood all the way underneath it so my dad could walk right up and then get in and then I could lower the boat without having the water there. But again, that's not everyone, but with your current or the existing policy, that would give them the flexibility in those cases to do that. Not everyone, but those people like the blizzards. Commissioner Lee. So in summary, what I think I hear you saying is you want us to leave the square footage at 560 or you want us to abandon any minimum or maximum requirements period and just leave it to the late court? I, I like your 560 and the reason I like your 560 is there are people like me who the late corporation has no authority over. So having that regulation in there keeps a a playing field. Now, if I want to go outside the 560, or it's totally on our property, I have the RID ability, which then goes to 300, I think 300 feet, uh, dozens of people who could then uh, weigh in and say, we're not for this, it's not enhancing it. So I like the 560 because there are many people who the Lake Corporation stamp is not needed from a legal standpoint. I think Mr. Boone could address that if it's on your property, your property only. I don't believe the Lake Corporation has, I don't even need to go to Lake Corporation for that. And there's too many of those to just say, oh, just give it up and uh, I like your regulation. That's okay. me. Okay, thank you. That's what I wanted to clarify. All right, thank you. I see no other questions from commissioners. So again, oh. thank you, Mr. Okay, Department. thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think we have one. Uh, I can't I don't know. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Don, uh, go ahead. Uh, I have a question for the city. Uh, listen, I might have missed it, and I probably did, but uh, how exactly did this particular item get on our agenda? We've heard from two people uh, extensively now that have lived here for a long time. Uh, and so is it because we got some legal requirement to deal with this, or is there some, I, I, I think uh, Commissioner Pepe uh, uh, alluded to this and maybe even he asked a question, I just didn't pick up on it. Or was it equivalent to the city getting complaints that somebody built the purple house in our neighborhood and we're not gonna ever have that again. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out so could Commissioner Phillips, if I may interrupt, just a point of order. We're going through a public testimony and I think you're wanting to ask questions to the staff. And so I'd like to defer that and see if we have any public testimony. So if you don't have a direct uh, question to Mr. Barman, I would like to uh, let him uh, return. Uh, is there any questions that you'd like to ask Mr. Barman? No, thank you. And I appreciate it. I just didn't want to make sure that we had an opportunity to discuss the, that sure. particular uh, item. We'll come back Thanks. to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barman, for your testimony. Uh, Iris, was there anyone else that wished to give testimony? No. All right, uh, since we have no further individuals that would like to give public testimony, I'll close uh, the public testimony at this time. Uh, so the public testimony is closed. Uh, commissioners, uh, questions for staff that you'd like uh, further clarifications based on some of the testimony that we had. Uh, Commissioner Phillips, if you'd like to go ahead uh, and succinctly ask your question to staff. But I mean, I'll, I'll just simplify it as the best I can. How did we get this agenda item? Was it something we had to deal with? So there was some legal requirement or something in the city code that we had to touch it? Or was it simply the city was getting complaints that people were building the purple house in the neighborhood, boat houses that just were outrageous and we don't want any more of that, okay? Uh, Chair Heath, Commissioner Phillips, I, you know, I made some comments earlier about the city's work to update the flood management overlay. 
that's not really what initiated this. What the way the reason this came about was that we've had building plan reviews that the city has uh, received plans for boathouses that were in excess of what the Lake Corporation would allow, and then only to discover after either approving them or having the Lake Corporation tell the property owner that they would not be approved because they were in excess of their standards, having to um, redo that work. And so there was an administrative um, issue that we came across between the building department and the Lake Corporation, where the Lake Corporation actually said, you know, our, our limit is 500 square feet. You, you know that, right? And so we said, well, perhaps we ought to calibrate our standard so that it's, uh, you know, in alignment with theirs, although recognizing that there are pro projects and properties to, for which the Lake Corporation standards do not apply. And you heard testimony on that this evening. Um, but there are projects and properties where these um, improvements that go in um, straddle the uh, lot and, and the Lake Corp property for which, you know, both sets of standards apply potentially. So, uh, you know, it was really just a desire to try to bring our two sets of standards into alignment, recognizing that the city has no obligation to do that. Um, and also understanding that the Lake Corporation has different um, abilities to modify or adjust or, you know, vary from their standards. And they may consider different reasons for allowing a larger uh, boathouse than, than the city would. Although the city's process, I think, as you've heard earlier, is called residential infill design review. So it's a design-based determination that, that considers public input from adjoining property owners. And so I think from that standpoint, the city and the Lake Corporation have common interests in trying to maintain you know, a high aesthetic standard and sight lines and compatibility. So it was really just Commissioner Phillips a desire to have some consistency and also recognizing that there may be exceptions and variances that would um, be needed. So that's where it came from. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any more questions? I see none. Uh, Planner uh, Prestead, is there additional uh, feedback or additional presentation material you'd like to provide? Uh, not at this time. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm thinking it may be a good point to take a short break uh, and then we'll come back. Uh, we'll take a seven minute break uh, and then we'll rejoin at eight. What do we have in this package? We'll come back and uh, discuss that. Yeah. So I'd like okay. to adjourn uh, for seven minutes and we'll come back.
Thank you. I'd like to call the meeting back to uh, order. Uh, we'll continue on. Uh, so the question uh, Commissioner Leek was asking was, uh, what is the wishes of the commission tonight? Uh, would we like to make a preliminary recommendation uh, tonight back to uh, staff? Uh, or do you think that there may be an opportunity to hear uh, more uh, testimony? I think, you know, um, one interesting idea would be to uh, see if the Lake Corp would like to uh, come and give testimony. I think it was pointed out by at least one of the commissioners tonight that, you know, they thought that would be fairly important. It could be an important issue for the Lake Corp to come. There may be uh, others that we may uh, want to hear from. So I think that's the decision that we want to uh, decide is, uh, do we think everybody that's uh, wanted to, uh, you know, provide t testimony tonight that has, that would be extremely uh, valuable? Uh, or, um, you know, do we do we want to give a little bit more opportunity to have uh, more testimony and continue? Uh, commissioners, any feedback? Commissioner Lee? I think that if the Lake Corp was interested, they would have been here and would have weighed in or at least written a letter. I don't think they're operating in a void and there must be cognizant that this is going on if these gentlemen are here as citizens <clears throat> and prior um, members of the board of the Lake Corp. So I don't think that's, to me personally, it's not important. Um, and that's just one of the issues on the whole list of things that we need to either approve or disapprove. So my question is, are we voting on each individual one, one through six, or are we? No, we'll vote on the entire code amendments and then any modifications to them or any suggestions for changes to the uh, suggested uh, code updates. Uh, we can give that feedback. Uh, okay, so we vote on the whole code okay. amendment update. Yeah, recommendation on a whole, okay. if any changes. Vice Chair Pepe. I wholeheartedly agree with what Commissioner Leek was just saying. Um, I don't think there's any necessary reason or, or, or good justification to postpone this any further. Um, if the Lake Corporation uh, wanted to be present and or provide testimony, they've had ample opportunities to. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, any feedback? No? It sounds like the recommendation from the commission then is to make a preliminary recommendation tonight uh, that we will not continue, but we'll make our preliminary recommendation tonight. Uh, so uh, with that, I would uh, like to open it up uh, for uh, deliberation. And I guess the way we can do this is just kind of step through. Uh, Evan, I'm not sure if you could share your slides on uh, each one of the items. We can go through and discuss it. Uh, Attorney Boone, is there any comment that you wish to make on our well, process? <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, yes, the commission is going to make a recommendation to the city council. The question is, is it a recommendation to approve all of them, some of them, none of them? So I think you'd end up, you could end up with a motion to say, I recommend five, six, and seven, but uh, denies, you know, one, two, and four, you know, you, but that would be in the motion and then there'd be some amendments to fight it out, but ultimately, you know, we're looking for one motion to make that forward. Now, so, sometimes we can't get there. But we would reflect then in the uh, in the commission minutes, and I think even in the findings that go forward to say that this was a straw poll by the commission. But then it's the motion to take the whole thing forward with the straw polls. So, thank you, Attorney Boone. No further questions. If we can see the slide presentation, we can just kind of walk through. Okay. Well, the first one is on the uh, maintenance amendments, uh, items number one and two, uh, the building design standards for commercial, industrial, and multifamily, and then number two, 180 day extensions. Uh, commissioners, uh, any uh, changes or feedback on these two? Generally okay with them. Nobody objects. All right, thanks. Go forward. Uh, next page three, four, and five. 
Any comments? Is everybody in favor uh, of recommending these, or are there any objections, changes? See none. All right. We'll move ahead. On policy amendments, expand the hours for Saturday market types uses on Sunday. So everybody's okay with this? Sure, Commissioner Buchanan. I don't know why uh, we would have a change from what it is on Saturday to Sunday. That's that's all. So you're not sure, but you're okay with changing it, or you're saying you're against well, changing I, I, it? It says eight to four uh, Saturdays, and then uh, eleven to four on Sunday. So why I don't understand why wouldn't it just be eight to four on Sundays? Current code permits from eight to four Saturdays, and uh, on Sundays from one to five. I, I don't know why Sundays would be different than Saturday. I guess. Uh, Commissioner. Buchanan, I think we did hear from some of that, though, when the parks came and they talked about just, uh, I thought they had did some, you know, I got some input on, you know, what would work for the vendors and the other folks that were coming and that setup time of around 11 a.m. seemed to work for them. So it's okay. my recolle recollection that the parks department did look at that and it wasn't kind of a random thing, but it was based on some of the input they got from uh, working with the vendors and others. All right, so I think we're okay with it, or can we? Yeah. Okay. All right, so move on. All right, the boathouses. This is where I think we can have discussion. Uh, so, uh, commissioners, who would like to go first? Commissioner Lee? Um, this is the one where I have, would have to say we should just leave it be at 560 and let the Lake Corporation judiciate over it if they if they want to dig their heels in at 500, so be it. If they want to allow a larger, five, up to 560, that's up to the Lake Corp. And again, I think it's a unique situation. Um, if you've ever lived on the lake, it's a unique ecosystem, and we should allow them that privilege. Thank you, Commissioner Lee. Commissioner Stewart? Uh, yeah, I, I, yes, I would agree with Commissioner Leake. I, I think there is enough. Um, I think there's enough variation among the, the many types of properties on the north and the south side of the lake that I'm very nervous about um, reducing the allowable size just based on some of the discussions we had, and especially. Um, the accessible issue, I think. Um, I'm not certain that what is being built now works well, and I would, I would, in terms of accessibility, I would hate to pull that in further. So I, I would be inclined just to um, stay where we are. Thank you, Commissioner Stewart. Commissioner Rigby? Um, well, I, I'm just thinking about uh, the fact that, you know, we heard in the, the public testimony that there is a process um, by which one with uh, the approval of neighbors can um, seek a larger boathouse if that's required. Um, it, it seems that the, the reason for, you know, for having rules regarding the size of the boathouse, at least according to staff, is to uh, is for the benefit of the the neighborhood environment, um, and so I I think I am inclined to, in that case, err on the side of this the greater simplicity which having a uniform five hundred feet would create. Um, and looking at the accessibility issue, I, like I said before, the boathouses which I've seen, uh, one enters onto the boat directly through large doors, directly through the wall with a patio outside. So, so there's all the room in the world for a, a wheelchair to you know, go on the deck or patio you know, directly adjoining the boathouse. Um, so I, did, I think at, at this point, I'm more inclined to uh, go towards the 500. 
Thank you, Commissioner Rigby. Uh, Vice Chair Pepe. Uh, Commissioner Phillips, any comments uh, from the web? Uh, Vice Chair Pepe. I think we may be having an audio issue. We can't hear you, Vice Chair Pepe. Uh, Iris, is there anything that we need to do? Or is there? Okay, thank you. In the interim, let me say that uh, I'm, I would encourage sticking with the current uh, limitation of 560 square feet. Um, from my perspective, the difference between 500 and 560 is really nominal, uh, particularly when you're talking about, you know, being on the same plane, the height is the same, et cetera. Okay. But it's, uh, it's space that, you know, comes at a premium to those who need it. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Buchanan. Uh, Vice Chair Pepe, can you, can we hear you now? No, sorry. Uh, Commissioner Phillips, uh, uh, can we check in on you and see if we get your audio? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Let's go back to Vice Chair Pepe now and see if his audio too is working. Vice Chair Pepe. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay, go ahead and we'll come back to you, Commissioner Phillips. <laughs> like, sorry. like a cellular a cellular telephone commercial. Um, I, I really was anticipating uh, in this meeting having it be much shorter based on what my original understanding was of, of why this was being brought forward. That's now changed a bit based on some clarifications. And, and while I empathize with some of what those, uh, with our two speakers um, conveyed, I think we also need to keep in perspective, um, voting takes place also outside of Lake Oswego. And there are hundreds of thousands of boats that are stored outside with a great cover. Some of them put a tarp over it. Um, there are many boats that are stored in the water uh, throughout the spring, summer, and fall, uh, whether on a river or on a lake, uh, that do just fine uh, and don't necessarily need to be in a, an enclosed um, structure. <clears throat> First moving to Lake Oswego, we looked at a piece of property that had an extremely long stairway down and it actually had a funicular to go from the house on down um, and passed on that once we realized whatever that, it sounds like there's a um, standard saying of, you know, the, 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 you know, forget the mustard, you got to go up those stairs. You know, we all have choices to make when, when we buy properties, but outside of that and with, while I empathize with the city and staff and the time and trying to figure out whether or not 530 or 560 or, or, or a larger structure is going to work and going through that process, I, I can't get on board with moving forward um, with this proposal or, and or request. Um, I would highly recommend staff going back and taking another look at it and figuring out how to make maybe a stronger argument uh, because I do think that there needs to be some consistency whether you live on the lake or you live off the lake when you have um, another structure on your property that there shouldn't necessarily be special allowances for whether you're on a lake or you're on the golf course or you abut to a major thoroughfare, there should be consistency. But I just can't, unfortunately, get on board with the argument that was that was made for this. Um, so I think we should keep it as it is. Uh, and, and in the event that it does come up next time, um, we look at it. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Pepe. We just make sure that we're understanding your comments. When you say leave it as is, you're saying keep this the uh, standard at 560, don't reduce it to 500. Uh, is that is that correct or is it the other way? Are you saying keep it at, okay. Thank correct. you. Commissioner Phillips. Okay, well, <clears throat> this is certainly a tough one. Uh, I'm gonna have to draw upon my experience again uh, as being a president of an HOA, a large HOA, 
And usually when anything would come up that affected all or most of the property, or at least hundreds of properties, um, I would have had people uh, in my front yard if this was a big problem, okay? And, uh, and not minimizing um, uh, consistency, I believe that is, but we're not talking about a situation in my opinion, I I'm sure we're not talking of no regulation or some regulation, we're talking about fine tuning some consistency uh, regulation. So uh, with, with that said, I think I'm going to, uh, uh, since uh, the city has not heard from hundreds of residents having a uh, problem with the way things are going and the purple house has not been built that the realtors would go nuts about, uh, then I, I think I'm gonna agree with the, uh, that we should probably leave it alone, 560 and 500. It seems to be close enough for consistency to me to give enough uh, leeway to homeowners to deal with what they've got. And uh, one size just doesn't fit all in very many circumstances. So I vote keep it like it is, 560 and 500. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Folks. Uh, Commissioners, any other comments? Uh, uh, um, I'm just uh, trying to summarize here. Uh, Vice Chair Pepe, uh, recommendation leave at 560. Commissioner Phillips at uh, 560. Uh, Commissioner Buchanan. Uh, 560. 560. Uh, Commissioner Stewart at 562. Right. Uh, Commissioner Rigby. 500. And Commissioner Leak. Sorry. 60. All right. uh, so I, I would say that uh, thanks for those who came out tonight and gave uh, testimony. It was uh, very much appreciated. And I think uh, some of your arguments uh, were very good. One that uh, resonated to me is, you know, don't regulate where we don't need to regulate, you know, and especially if there's not a problem to be solved. Uh, so I think those were great arguments. I think, you know, the uh, concern that was expressed from disability uh, we all have to be concerned about that and make sure that we're very inclusive uh, in trying to accommodate uh, all individuals to, you know, enjoy all the aspects of our city. So I really appreciate those comments. Um, for me, uh, you know, uh, uh, the reason why we're here and it's under this item is for the uh, annual code amendments, maintenance amendments. We're really trying to clean up our code. We're trying to, uh, you know, fix issues uh, where there's been misunderstandings uh, code's not clear, and um, from my perspective, I think, again, there was lots of great arguments made, but uh, there is, um, you know, this desire to keep our code simple, to keep it consistent, to not have, you know, confusion between the Lake Corp and the city on having different standards. Homeowners uh, know, you know, what uh, the standard is, and uh, it's very consistent uh, between those. And then you know, the, the properties that are in the floodplain, the other issue is to kind of have a streamlined process for them that will help them too. Uh, so it's an over the counter type of uh, process that they got to go through with the uh, city uh, rather than, you know, maybe dealing with FEMA. And so for those arguments, I would be in favor of, uh, you know, uh, keeping the code amendments as it's stated in the staff report at 500. Uh, so changing it to 500. Uh, so with that, then we have, um, Two commissioners at 500, and uh, one, two, three, four, the five at uh, 560. Uh, and so we can factor that into our motion uh, at the end, but um, for a straw poll, I think that's where it's at. Any final comments on this, uh, Commissioner Lee? Yeah, um, I want to thank Mr. Eves and Mr. Barnum for coming and testifying, and perhaps go, suggest that you go to the Lake Court and ask them to up it to 560 so we have a mutually acceptable code and Lake Corp policy. Good idea. Thank you. All right. So uh, we'll come back to the presentation. Uh, was there any further uh, code items in the presentation or the, um, I think there was, right? There's yeah, on this, yeah. on this item, there was, there's two parts to it. Yeah. So you limit the, the maximum size. And the second part is just clarifying that side mirror setbacks don't apply to Boat houses within the Lake Oswego setback. Thank you for that clarification. 
So commissioners, just on that before we move away, were there any uh, changes uh, requested to the side and rear yard setbacks not applying to both houses within the Lake Oswego setback of 25 feet, none? Uh, Commissioner Phillips or Vice Chair Pepe, no, no objections on that? Okay, so I think we're good with that portion. Uh, next, the clarifying building design standards on multi-building sites. Commissioners, any comments on this? Any changes or objections to this? None. Vice Chair Pepe, Commissioner Phillips, I don't see any on yours. Okay, move ahead. Online neighborhood meetings. Commissioners, okay with this? Commissioner Phillips and Vice Chair Pepe, okay too. Okay, we'll move on. Online uh, public hearings. Uh, this would allow uh, hybrid hearings to comply with House Bill 2560. Any comments, changes? Uh, Commissioner Rigby. Yeah. Um, I recall when we were talking before about this that there was, um, we, we were talking about being able to submit testimony um, and to continue the proceedings. And we talked about that, that in the quasi-judicial context. Um, what, would there be an effect there in a, a legislative process? Yeah, I think so. We're, we're checking on it right now. Thank you. The, the uh, code sections before you deal with a public hearing before a, a hearing body on a major development application or appeal of minor development decision. So you're looking at, at quasi-judicial applications, not, not legislative. Okay, thank you. Then I have no objection. Right. Commissioners, any others? Uh, objections? Uh, Commissioner Phillips or Vice Chair Pepe, none. All right, commission's good with this. Okay, that was the last one. All right, then I think what we heard from the commission is that we'd like to make a motion uh, for a preliminary recommendation on approving uh, LU 21-0057, the 2021 Annual Community Development Code Amendments, uh, with the uh, modification of the item on the uh, boathouse sizes uh, we'd like to uh, take out the change uh, from uh, 500 square feet and leave it as is at 560 square feet. Uh, anyone like to make a motion? I make a motion <laughs> that we approve um, the code amendment changes as stated except for the boathouse square footage requirement. We're leaving that at 560 as it yes. currently is. Is there a second? I'll second. Right. Commissioner Stewart seconds. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? I'll say opposed, uh, just for the uh, boat house. Again, I like trying to keep the code amendments to uh, you know, clarify and simplify it. Uh, any other nays? Um, I, I'll also be a nay. Uh, any abstains? I don't believe there's any. Vice Chair Pape or Commissioner Phillips? You guys? Chair Heap, sorry, yes. just point of order. Can we make sure that we have a vote from the two commissioners uh, in Zoom, Phillips and Pape, please? You mean an explicit vote, Scott, well, that we, we want to hear from them? Well, I, I don't think we heard, for, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear them. Did you? No. No. Uh, Can you hear so Vice Chair Pape, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I was approved. Commissioner Phillips? Oh, you're muted. Uh, Commissioner, yes, yes, to you. yes I, I approve as Commissioner Leake uh, uh, motioned. 
Thank so you. the motion passes five to two then. Uh, we look uh, forward to staff uh, bringing back the uh, finding conclusions in order based on our preliminary recommendation tonight. Thank that, you. That would be February 14th. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So next on our agenda is a work session. Uh, this is item 7.1, House Bill 2000 Word 1, work session number 3, PP 19-008. Uh, public comments are accepted. Uh, the commission will review the outline of the required amendments to design and dimensional standards for caustic caust cottage clusters and provide direction to staff on drafting code language. The staff coordinator is Eric Olson, senior planner. Uh, planner Olson, would you like to give us a presentation for tonight? Chair Heap, yes, I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, and I should just mention before I get started, um, so we're here for the third of four scheduled work sessions on the proposed code amendments for House Bill 2001. Um, I'm also joined by Rachel Cotton from Cascadia Partners, who's here to present with me tonight. I'll be handling the majority of the presentation, but she'll be helping out with some of the clarifying questions and um, just helping sort of keep things on track. Um, with that being said, I'll move forward. So just to go over what we're going to cover tonight, um, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible so we can uh, get home at a reasonable time tonight or go to bed or um, at least uh, finish at a reasonable time. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the recent public engagement that we've been doing related to this project. I'll try to make that very quick though and then we'll talk a little bit more about cottage clusters which are the last mineral housing type that we need to discuss um, and some of the options that are available for us to consider in terms of dimensional and design standards for cottage clusters. So um, as I discussed, um, you know, we're going to just touch really quickly on some of the recent public engagement that has occurred related to middle housing here in Lake Oswego. Um, a lot of this occurred back in December, so um, it didn't quite get included in the early January Planning Commission work session. So just wanted to um, give you an update here. Um, on the 7th of December, we held a, or we launched rather a middle housing story map and that included a survey as well. Um, on, you know, successful through the city's website. Um, it, you know, was designed as, to essentially provide information on middle housing code concepts that we're considering um, here at the city for compliance with House Bill 2001 and to gather feedback from the public on some key remaining questions um, that needed to be answered prior to implementation um, in addition to some general just kind of concern related questions. Um, so we received 93 responses to the five substantive questions that were included in that survey. Um, other ones were a little bit more um, demographic related, so we won't cover that tonight. The um, next thing that happened in December was a virtual forum covering very similar information to what we talked about at um, the, or in, in the story map. So we sort of presented that information live with slides and um, I was joined by our consultants at Cascadia Partners as usual. Uh, we had about 27 participants and that was on Thursday, December 9th. Um, we also covered the same questions or five substantive questions at that community forum that we asked on the story map. So I can go over some of those answers that we got for you folks today, but I also just wanted to keep you posted about some of the work that we were doing in December um, for outreach related to this work. All right, so this is the first poll question. It was really just kind of asking what um, in general, folks think would be the most important benefits of mental housing. As you can see, we had different answers. Affordability, equity, and inclusion um, allows for flexibility for property owners, allows different options for homeowners. And of course, there was a none um, answer option as well. And so you can see, just I'll, I'll highlight this very quickly, just there was um, the most uh, sort of excitement about the potential affordability benefits of middle housing. So we thought that was interesting. We also had a question about um, what folks were concerned about with middle housing. So you can see some of the options here, including incompatible scale, um, design, uh, fewer trees, traffic, privacy, and noise. And you can see that <clears throat> the largest concern was traffic. So I think 
that's something we'll have to keep in mind as we move forward um, with our work here and particularly as we look to some, some other types of changes that could be made um, in addition to the minimum requirements. Uh, there, there was another question about, you know, which of those concerns are not being addressed um, by the proposed changes in the development code. And we saw some discrepancy in the answers, but the number one um, answer remained traffic. So I thought that was um, worth sharing. Uh, we also asked some of the questions we're going to cover tonight related to the size of houses in a cottage cluster and whether they should be limited. Um, there was pretty clear consensus, 58% um, that uh, agreement that the city, should, the city should limit the size of cottage clusters so within a cottage cluster. And the last question that I'll cover is just a um, question that we've covered in previous work sessions related to minimum lot size and whether we should require larger lots or the same size lots as single family houses for triplexes, quadplexes, and cottage clusters. So they uh, came to a similar conclusion, which we shared with you a little bit of preview uh, at our last work session, but um, almost 70% of respondents, combined respondents, um, preferred uh, concept one larger lots. So that was consistent with what we heard from commissioners as well. And just to talk quickly about next steps, of course, we're here at the work session on the 24th, but we have another one scheduled um, for the 15th. Um, we also have uh, neighborhood association presentations that are currently being offered and have been offered since um, November. Um, so we're open to requests there. We're also planning to hold a community forum, another community forum um, in March of this year, so just in a couple of months. Um, so we'll be going over some of, you know, more of where we landed with some of the remaining questions related to the code amendments for middle housing. And of course, there will be opportunity for input at the planning commission and city council hearings. Um, we have the first of two scheduled hearings at the planning commission scheduled for April 12th. And I'll just stop really quickly there to cover if there are any questions related to that before I get into the more uh, meaty content related to um, tonight's work session on cottage clusters. Commissioners, any questions? Commissioner Phillips or Vice Chair Pepe? All right, so I'll just move ahead if that's all right. Please. So we're here to mostly, um, at least um, this presentation is centered on cottage clusters. Um, and so, you know, I know we've talked about this several times throughout the last couple of years at the Planning Commission, but just to go over some of the basics here, you know, cottage clusters are essentially a development concept wherein you have multiple smaller detached um, houses or homes that are sited relatively close together and they're oriented around a common green or a common courtyard. Um, so the definition that's in Division 46 is the one that we're sort of stuck with for the purposes of our implementation. And that is, um, you know, that cottage cluster means a grouping of no fewer than four detached units per acre with a footprint of less than 900 square feet each that includes a common courtyard. And so um, it stipulates also that a medium or large city can allow those units to be located on a single lot or parcel or on individual lots or parcels. So I would also mention um, that, you know, some of the some of the interesting things we've been hearing from folks about cottage clusters are that you know, this is one of the middle housing types. I think we've heard a little bit more excitement from the community members uh, about. Um, you know, I think folks are excited that this could maintain some of the uh, some of the characteristics of single family housing or detached housing in terms of character and privacy, um, but that you would result in smaller and therefore potentially more affordable units. That was another um, you know thing that people were a little bit excited about with this. I'd also mention that folks were, um, you know, people that live in these developments have said that they also like living there because they sort of engender a communal feel. So they have this kind of orientation around a common courtyard that's supposed to encourage sort of interaction amongst the residents. So it's important to keep in mind, um, you know, that definition just because it really differentiates cottage clusters from other similar types of detached housing developments. Um, you know, there's some really important distinguishing features um, that, you know, we should talk about when it comes to cottage clusters, including that they're developed, again, as, as the, um, as I referred to in the last slide, it must be developed at a minimum density of at least four dwelling units per acre. Um, and so that's fairly straightforward in terms of 
what the city must do there. We have to apply that. Um, there are, we're also fairly limited when it comes to the building footprint. So we have a maximum or, you know, essentially a stipulation that we're not allowed to permit cottages and cottage cluster to have a building footprint of any more than 900 square feet. So it must be less than 900 square feet. Uh, Eric, good um, question on that. The, yeah. uh, the uh, footprint is synonymous with a uh, lot coverage. It's not floor area. Is that a correct understanding? Yes, so this would be just, you know, lot coverage as applied to an individual unit, more or less. So, um, yeah, that would be, you know, obviously if you're looking at the site as a whole, there might be multiple clusters. So, um, you know, that would be a different way to look at lot coverage. But yes, building footprint is essentially just lot coverage as applied to an individual cluster unit. Uh, so is this new terminology then? You can't use lot coverage because you're talking about, you know, clusters. Uh, and so there's a, a little bit different terminology in our code that's going from maybe lot coverage to a footprint? Yeah, that is something that we've, um, you know, noted is that, you know, we can't technically apply lot coverage limitations to cottage clusters, but there would be this limitation on the footprint of a cottage cluster. Is the footprint including the garage? It does include the garage, yes. Okay, and Mike, another quick question. The minimum density of at least four dwelling units per acre. What if it was a half acre? Could you have four dwellings on a half acre? Yeah, I mean, typically we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the okay. number of uh, units in a cottage cluster because that should answer that question. But thank you. Um, you know, it's highly unlikely that anything that meets the definition of a cottage cluster as we're proposing it would um, be anything close to um, four dwelling units per, per acre. That's fairly lenient. Um, Say that again. It's unlikely to have four uh, units per acre? Yes, cottage clusters by definition would be more dense than that and most sites would be, um, you know, including more like five cottage cluster units on a site that's much smaller than um, an acre. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the number of cottage cluster units, um, and that should, again, help, help clarify a little bit when we talk about um, what that looks like. Uh, so again, they're limited in terms of building, building footprint to 900 square feet, um, and each cluster must include that common courtyard. So they have some stipulations for the dimensions of that courtyard and other elements that must be addressed in the DLCD model code. Um, Commissioner Pepe. Real quick, it, I'm not seeing anywhere where it identifies how large that common area must be. Is there a reference that we can go off of or are you going to Yeah, that? yeah, I can skip ahead here. Um, I, can, I can talk about that. It's in the um, next few slides here, but it's not, um, I'm sorry, one second. So essentially the common courtyard um, would have to have a minimum area of 100, 150 square feet um, per dwelling. So that's kind of how it would work based on under, our understanding. And so that's how the model code sort of um, dictates the design standards um, for cottage clusters um, in terms of the courtyards. They have a minimum width of 15 feet and um, other sort of regulations that are included in the model code. So that would include some limitations on impervious area and a requirement that at least 50% of the cottages would orient towards the courtyard. And we can so make that a bigger? This in the I'm coming sorry. Slides. We, can, we could make that a bigger um, minimum courtyard size? Um, I'm not sure I'm able to to do that, I'll give it a shot. No, but I mean, uh, we could change the minimum courtyard size in our code? Uh, no, we, we, we don't have the discretion to do that. We can't make it larger? No. Interesting. Are there any other questions? Yeah, sorry, I, I guess I, I thought we had the ability, if it says the minimum area is 150 yeah. square feet per dwelling, could we not make it 175? 
no, these are, um, they, we need to have either something that's um, either what's in the model code or something that's less restrictive than what's in the model code. So this is the maximum that we could require would be that 150 square foot per dwelling unit. Gotcha, okay. So we could put it at 125. We could do lower if we okay. wanted to, yeah. All right, so again, we'll, we'll sort of get back on track here. Um, just, you know, I think there's other elements that are in the model code itself that would, um, you know, be translated into our uh, sort of uh, regulations here because that's, you know, from our understanding, the best option that we have, more or less. Um, so when it comes to cottage clusters, you know, it's, um, it's something where I think we, are going to run into a lot of um, these areas where we're not really providing much discretion to do anything different than the minimum compliance track. Um, and essentially that again, minimum compliance track is either, you know, what's in the DLCE model code or something less restrictive than what's in that model code. So in a lot of cases, it ends up being um, the model code that makes the most sense for us to go with. But there are some, there are some areas where we'll focus where we do have some discretion tonight. Um, but I'm going to cover on this slide a lot of the things where we don't have much discretion. So I would say that, you know, we already discussed the minimum lot sizes for different types of what we would call higher middle housing. So related to triplexes, quadplexes, and cottage clusters. So based on what we heard there, we would assume that we would go with the um, sort of larger lot uh, concept for cottage clusters as well, um, that we would have no greater than 7,000 square foot lot for cottage clusters as a minimum lot size, um, or whatever the minimum lot size is that would be applied to single family houses in the zone, whichever is greater. Um, so we talked about that with some of the other housing types in previous work sessions. Um, in general, minimum lot width could not be different than, or cannot be greater than it would be for a single family standard. Um, the maximum density is something that we can't really apply to cottage clusters, though it would have a minimum density requirement that we discussed on the last uh, slide or two. There's different setbacks, and I think that's probably one of the biggest things to point out for cottage clusters, is that the minimum setbacks on all sides are 10 feet. So that is different in many zones, if not all zones, just um, off the top of my head, at least the majority of the zones that we're talking about for these regulations would have different sort of minimum setbacks around the edges of the lot um, because the idea is that there would be more room sort of in the middle um, courtyard area where the cottage clusters would sort of be um, oriented around. In terms of minimum separation between buildings, um, we uh, can go up to 10 feet, but no more than 10 feet for the minimum separation. Um, again, that maximum building footprint is set at 900 square feet, so we can have no, um, no more than 900 square feet, or it has to be less than 900 square feet to be precise. In terms of lot coverage, as we were talking about before, we have to sort of go with this building footprint um, concept instead of lot coverage as we would have it in the code currently, so we would not apply a lot coverage standard to, or we would not be able to apply under the um, state sort of minimum requirements, um, we would not be able to apply a maximum lot coverage standard other than that maximum building footprint. Um, in terms of floor area ratio, uh, we can't, it's kind of similar in that we can't apply that to the sort of cottage cluster development as a whole, but we can um, regulate the individual cottage cluster units themselves. So that's something that we're gonna talk a little bit more tonight about is how we could place limitations on the amount of floor area that would be inside of a cottage cluster unit. Um, when it comes to maximum height, there really aren't, uh, there really isn't much wiggle room. Um, we can't really have it set at any lower than two stories. And um, when it comes to off street parking, we can't, um, as with other middle housing types, require more than one space per dwelling unit. I've got a question. Go ahead, Commissioner Phillips. Uh, I'm having trouble with this maximum height. I, I just simply don't understand no lower than two stories. Can I have 10 stories? Uh, cities could theoretically set their maximum height limit at 10 stories, um, but I'm, that's not what we're recommending. So the maximum height is kind of written in terms of like what cities can apply. 
Um, so the city could not have a maximum height limit that's less than two stories high. <laughs> okay, I'm sure. missing something. No lower is 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 you can't go below two stories. You've got to have two stories. It's but a minimum height, not a maximum. No, we're we're talking about minimum maximums here. It's kind of confusing, so I apologize. So we're talking about maximum height regulations. So this is the way, and and again, this is kind of about what cities are allowed to do, not what developers are allowed to do. So maximum height would say a developer cannot build you know, higher than two stories high. Um, you know, cities could theoretically um, also, I don't know what happened here. Um, cities could theoretically also, you know, say that, you know, it could be 10 stories high. Um, you know, you can't, you know, you, you can build up to 10 stories. You know, that's, that's not something the state is going to be um, preventing, but, um, you know, there's still essentially, you know, the, the takeaway here is that we can't do a maximum height regulation, any less than two stories tall. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Stewart. And ju just to clarify again on the maximum building footprint and maximum lot coverage, it was stated earlier that the footprint and the lot coverage are the same, but what I'm seeing here is that we're not considering lot coverage because lot coverage includes, beyond the footprint, it includes overhangs and drip lines and things like that so we're on so when we talk about footprint we're talking literally the perimeter of the building walls correct yes yeah, so again when we're talking about it's it's similar to law coverage um so we would be talking about um yeah the sort of footprint of the building and i can look into i believe that is something that's defined um by the state um so that we can talk a little bit about the difference between lot coverage and building footprint, because of course there's, um, you know, there are other elements that might be above 30 inches in height that would be um, potentially not um, included in the unit itself, perhaps on the, on a cottage cluster development. So um, anyway. Well, yeah, like a, like a deck comes to mind, like a, a, a raised deck that might be a little higher than 30 inches, for example. So one, one other reason why I, I think the state is distinguished between footprint and lot coverage is that these cottage clusters may be multiple units on one lot. And so lot coverage under our code would be the cumulative lot coverage of all those units where the state is really interested in, uh, I guess, prescribing the maximum size of or coverage of that one, you know, individual units. So well, it would be impossible to enforce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I apologize for a confusion there because it's it's a it's a concept that's similar to lot coverage, but again, just as it applies to that one um, cottage cluster unit, so it's not floor area because you're just looking at the unit, the cottage cluster unit itself. Um, so I can give you some clarification. I, I was looking to get um, a definition right now, but I, I can't access that. No, no, I think that that works, Eric. I mean, I mean, basically, you're saying that we, we, we can't consider lot coverage here. So, you know, I can we can leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, there are things that we might consider within our lot coverage standards that would not be captured within the building footprint um, for a cottage cluster unit. All right, so I'll move forward to the next slide if, if there are no more questions, at least. Um, and so I can try to zoom in on some portions of this. It's included in the materials as well, so hopefully that's um, helpful. I'm trying to see if I can zoom in quickly here. I've done this before. Um, but the, you know, the sort of the takeaway is here is that there's really limited discretion to modify, you know, what we see as the standards from DLCD for cottage clusters, but we do have some discretion in certain areas. So that's what we're trying to focus on today. Um, you know, I will talk a little bit more about those courtyard standards when we get into what we would call a design standard. Um, it's kind of a strange uh, delineation between dimensional and design standards, but it is an, an important one for the purposes of um, House School 2001. So um, we have a little bit more um, discretion with certain things related to design standards than we would otherwise. Um, but um, yeah, obviously that's, it depends on, on the element. So 
Um, anyway, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about that on another slide, but you can see here just kind of what a cottage cluster development would look like laid out, including that sort of minimum separation um, between units, uh, the minimum sort of width of the courtyard itself in the middle, um, and what the sort of size of that common courtyard is um, with that sort of 150 square feet per dwelling unit um, minimum uh, applied. And so this is a little bit, um, you know, I think this is something where you see like a six, uh, six unit cottage cluster here. So these are a little bit smaller uh, units. So um, just something to get folks oriented really, just to see what some of these developments can look like in plan view and how um, these regulations look, might look like on a typical site. Um, of course, this is a site that would be about 12,000 square feet in size. So this is something that would likely be in our 10 district um, with 100 foot depth and 120 foot uh, street frontage. And I'll talk more about the parking standards as well on another slide. So for now though, I wanted to focus though on this question of the number of units in a cottage cluster. Um, under the rules, we do have some flexibility to clarify the minimum number of units required for a cottage cluster development. Um, we don't necessarily have to, according to the state, we don't have to at least set a minimum number of units, but the city would be allowed to require a minimum of either three, four or five dwelling units in a cottage cluster. So when it comes to some of the pros and cons here, I just wanted to talk about those briefly. Um, you know, when it comes to the recommendations, we're kind of looking at mostly, you know, difference between requiring four units per cottage cluster and five units per cottage cluster. Um, one of the biggest things that we wanted to think about here was sort of differentiating cottage clusters from other types of housing. Um, we know that there are, or other types of middle housing specifically, we know that we've received direction from council and the planning commission, I believe as well, um, that detached uh, plexes, if you will, detached triplexes, duplexes and quadplexes are something that we didn't want to really take on um, with this component of our code amendments. So based on some of that uh, input that we've been getting, we, we do think that it would make sense to require a minimum of five units in a cottage cluster development to sort of differentiate it from what could be seen as something very similar to a detached quadplex or a cottage cluster with four units. Um, it could be a little bit confusing. There would be some differences, but we just didn't really want to muddle those waters or muddy those waters. Um, so, you know, I think just to talk this through a little bit more, um, we think it would be also sort of consistent with city council direction related to neighborhood character. Um, you know, we would be more or less requiring um, larger sites for cottage cluster housing would be um, a little bit difficult to fit five units on some of these smaller sites. So that would also be, I think, consistent with some of the direction we've received from council. Um, you know, on the flip side, it may sort of limit the development feasibility on smaller sites. So it would prevent, um, you know, the development of, of cottage clusters in areas where um, they might otherwise pop up. So if it's something that we want to promote, um, you know, this wouldn't be the best option. Um, when it comes to you know the idea of requiring at least four units per cottage cluster again we <clears throat> we think that would allow a little bit more flexibility but it could um, really encourage developers to build some larger units um, that could you know I think not be as consistent with neighborhood character as some of those smaller units and um, you know it could be a little bit complex to sort of differentiate between a potential um, detached fourplex and a cottage cluster with four units so we just wanted to avoid that potential confusion. So with that being said, I'll just stop here and um, open this up to the planning commission to see um, what your input is regarding this recommendation. And Mr. Chair, may I give just sure. my global yes. reminder that this is of course a work session to direct staff as to what should be in the public hearing presentation. And this is not the time for the commission to deliberate and decide the issue. Uh, thank you for that point. That. Attorney Boone. So I think if we take that advice, we may move fairly quicker tonight and be focused. So thank you. Um, one question uh, around this, Eric, is that aren't these bound to the lot size? Like it's uh, require at least four units per cottage cluster on an acre. I thought it was bound to like an acre size or is this unconstrained uh, to an acre? 
Uh, it, it is constrained to an acre, but again, this is, acres are much larger than the typical minimum lot size in, in, a, in an area. So um, when it comes to those, that's a minimum density. Um, and that minimum density would be, um, you know, the, this would easily meet the minimum density requirement. That would not be in conflict. Okay. Uh, commissioners, any comments on providing these two options uh, for uh, public comment to the testimony? Is there anyone that thinks we should have different options, more or less only one? No, it seems like we're good with this. Uh, yeah, Vice Chair Pepe. Um, yeah, uh, Eric, if you can help clarify something in your pro for four units per cottage cluster, you indicate may encourage developers to build larger units, but isn't, isn't the max, what would it be since it is at least two stories, nine, 1800 square feet. Um, well, we're going to talk about potential options for maximum size of the floor area um, or maximum floor area for a cottage cluster. Um, I think, you know, it might be something that should have been in a different category when, when we're talking about might encourage developers to build larger units. I think that's probably more of a con than a pro. Um, so I, I apologize for any confusion with, with that. Um, I do think, though, that, you know, one thing that we want to point out is that there is um, a little bit more flexibility if you're requiring less than four, or I'm sorry, less than five units if you're requiring four units um, in a cottage cluster instead of five, um, you do have a little bit more potential to site the cottage clusters in a way that could preserve trees or have more space um, than a five unit cottage cluster. So there are sort of different sides to the coin here. Okay, so, so you really, I'm going to leave that alone and, 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 and I'll see how the presentation goes, but I might, I might come back to you on that one. Uh, Commissioner Phillips. Uh, Eric, are these uh, options or can we have both of these? Uh, could, for example, you know, I mean, you might have a small lot, an acre, mm -hmm. and you want four, but you may have an acre and a half and you say, I want five. Can, is this an either or, or can we send both of these forward? So this is a minimum. So if you were to say, you know, minimum of four units, you could definitely have a cottage cluster unit with more than four units. Um, if you were to say a, a minimum of five units, you'd have less flexibility, but you could have more than five units in your cottage cluster size permitting. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Pape, just to answer your questions in terms of the size of these units, I think that's I think maybe I didn't directly get your, your answer with that one. So um, when it comes to the floor area of a cottage cluster, um, the maximum floor area, because that um, sort of building footprint is limited to 900 square feet and we're limited to, to two stories, you're correct that the maximum that we would, um, or that the city could sort of allow would be 1800 square feet per unit. So that is correct. So there are other ways, of course, to limit the uh, square footage of a cottage cluster unit. And again, we'll talk about that um, when we get to that question. Um, but in general, having a requirement for a less, um, for fewer sort of cottage cluster units on the site, um, just in general could sort of encourage a developer to take up a little bit more space per unit than, than if we were to require five. Thank you. Commissioner Buchanan. Just for clarity, uh, the 900 square foot footprint and the upper floor have to be the same or can there be cantilevers? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, there's no, um, there would be no um, restriction on the distribution of the floor area as long as you're sort of staying within that maximum building footprint of 900 square feet. Um, so typically you see a, a little bit more floor area on the bottom floor. Um, but, um, you know, if you're, yeah, if you have, you know, in a thousand square foot cottage cluster, um, it could be, you know, two 500 square foot floors. It could be one 900 square foot floor in a 100 square foot upper story. Um, you know, there's different ways they could be, you know, situated. Could you have the reverse of that and have uh, 700 down and 1100 up? 
uh, you would not be able to go over 900 square feet for any of the sort of uh, building walls of the cottage cluster unit. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, commissioners, any changes, recommendations to these options? We're good with them. Let them fly. Well, I think, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're looking for some guidance on uh, which option we should draft the code amendments for uh, to present in the public hearing rather than presenting multiple options, uh, multiple sets of code changes for public a public hearing, right? Well, yes, of course. So, I, I, yeah, I think just, yeah, if you're referring to Commissioner Phillips' question, um, then, yeah, I think, you know, we, we would like to choose one of these options, but there are, for a developer, you know, there's still the, uh, you know, capacity to build more than the minimum for the number of units. <clears throat> I think I got your point, Director Siegel. So yeah. I, I was maybe thinking the same that we wanted to maybe recommend having both of these options go forward to for public. But I think the point is staff is asking to pick one of these that we want to have go forward uh, to the public hearing. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, we will have to choose which one we'd like uh, to have at the public hearing. Vice Chair Pepe. Yeah, I, I would recommend that the minimum be set at five. And again, this is only for presenting an option to what the what you get public feedback on. So, okay. Uh, so the staff's recommendation here is to go forward at the public hearing uh, with the uh, option for a minimum of five. Is everybody in favor of that? Yes. Sorry. Uh, all right. I will come back to you, Commissioner Leak, one second, Commissioner Buchanan. I was just going to say that I, I recommend that we do five units per cottage cluster because it also m m mandates a larger lot in which to do it right. and clarifies it and makes it less muddy about quad boxes, et cetera. All right, thank you. Commissioner Buchanan. Eric, I was hoping uh, you could talk a little bit more about the uh, fourplex versus uh, four cottage cluster units. Um, and five cottage cluster units. It sounded like to you that was the main differentiator that there would not be confusion between a fourplex and a four unit uh, cottage cluster. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, I think we were just wanting to go forward with that recommendation to avoid sort of detached um, triplex, quadplex, and duplex configurations for our recommendations. So, um, you know, we thought that four units in a cottage cluster could be um, somewhat similar to a detached quadplex. And so we wanted to, again, provide that differentiation. Um, you know, there could be an opportunity to come back and look at potential regulations for detached quadplexes, but for now, you know, our, recommend our recommendation is to keep quadplexes um, to their attached sort of um, current sort of definition is attached um, that we've been going forward with at least currently um, and then when it comes to detach, then we go up to this five unit threshold. And, and just, it probably goes without saying, but just for the listening audience, we're not going to be proposing and we're not coming back with options that would allow detached forms of plexus, not without city council direction. So I know what you, I know what you meant, Eric, but you know, that, that could be misunderstood that we're, we're still considering that. We're not considering that as part of this project. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner, is there any other questions? Uh, and is this commission's recommendation to uh, present uh, the minimum of five units per cottage cluster uh, for the hearing? Is, uh, Commissioner Buchanan, uh, are you saying no, your recommendation? I, I mean, for, for me, uh, a fourplex versus a cottage cluster, um, the difference being that uh, they're independent versus attached. I, I don't know why somebody should be limited to that just based on the fact that we wanted to call this a, you know, fourplex versus a cottage cluster. So I don't know why we can't um, delineate what it is that we want to do with cottage clusters, period. And uh, people can develop as they see fit based within that. Thank you, Commissioner Buchanan. Uh, Commissioner Phillips or Vice Chair Pepe? Yes, uh, Commissioner Phillips first. Go ahead, Commissioner Phillips. Yeah, I have a quick question for Eric before I give you my, uh, the uh, 
can you quantify that op in the in the sense that option uh, the five units per would that likely lead to more uh, units over a period of time or can you quantify that do you believe or give a estimate I, I can't I certainly can't quantify it <laughs> um, right. at least not right now but I, I can try to um, I can try to respond um, you know I think as Commissioner Leak pointed out you know this might uh, discourage cottage clusters because you would need a little bit more size on your property to have five units than you would for four. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, when you do have a cottage cluster being developed, um, you're going to get five units instead of four. So, um, you know, that is, that is a sort of incremental increase, but I would say that with cottage cluster sort of market being what it is, which is uh, very, very, uh, you know, new and untested. Um, you know, I think it's more likely that the sort of lot conditions will impact what, you know, where these are developed, I would say. Um, you know, so I would think that the sort of uh, requiring more units per cottage cluster would ultimately result in less cottage cluster or fewer cottage cluster developments, um, although you might get more units per development. And, and under the state rules, Eric, isn't it correct that uh, although the minimum number maybe four or five, depending on where you set it. The state rules require the city to allow up to eight or at least eight. Is it yes. at least eight we must allow? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So. okay. I, it seems to me that the the, uh, the five units per cottage cluster makes the most sense. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, I, I understand the numbers will fall out where they are over a period of time and we'll just have, we won't know until we see a few years of this. But uh, the only thing I'd mention is saving trees in the option four, you know, but I, I don't I don't think it would be a, a big differential in preserving trees in the four versus the five. So I'll go with the five, thanks. Well, Vice Chair Pepe. Uh, Senior Planner Olson, can you please refresh my memory when we were talking about the distinctions several meetings ago between the cottage cluster and uh, a quadplex. And I believe you had indicated that actually in, I think it's also in the uh, triplex, they don't need to be necessarily attached. Is that correct or am I remembering it wrong? So we, we did discuss um, a few sessions back that um, the state does allow um, cities to say that you know, duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes can be detached. Um, so the state allows that. Um, and so you know, I would say that when we come to the city's decision-making processes, um, you know, we've talked about this as well. You know, there would be different regulations that would apply to a potential, you know, this unformed sort of idea of a detached plex. There would be different regulations that we could apply to that than what we can apply to a cottage cluster, which you can see, you know, there's a model code that DLCD has where they have a lot of sort of thought out standards about landscaping and courtyards and things like that, where we couldn't right. go forward and require those for detached plexes. So that's kind of, you know, I, I hope that answers your question in some way. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of the, the difference between a cottage cluster and a detached plex, at least in concept is that there's more sort of regulations that we are able to apply to a cottage cluster by definition through the rulemaking at the state. Perfect, thank you. I, uh, if there's no further comments, then what I think the commission is saying is uh, six uh, for requiring at least the five units per cottage class cluster as the option, and one uh, as a recommendation, there's one commissioner is recommending uh, the four. So the uh, uh, recommendation from the commission is to go forward with the option for requiring at least five units per cottage cluster. Great. Um, thank you for that direction. That's really helpful as we go forward to the hearing. Um, so coming to the next topic, which is um, related and also, um, you know, sort of gets into some of these details when it comes to cottage clusters. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the size of individual units in a cottage cluster. So 
you know, technically under Division 46 rules, we have to sort of say that cottage clusters are exempt from lot coverage or FAR. But um, as we've talked about already, we have things like uh, maximum building footprint and uh, maximum square footage um, that can control those things per unit as opposed to on the site as a whole. Um, so to further address some uh, of the bulk and scale concerns that could come along with cottage clusters, um, we've brought forth some options that would include sort of limiting the size of cottage clusters, um, the, the size of each unit in a cottage cluster specifically, in addition to that building footprint limitation to sort of see what that could help out with, with some of these scale and um, bulk concerns. So just to talk through a little bit, this is a table that we developed sort of talking about what this all means. So we took a look at different options and different zones for developments. Um, now you can see at the bottom, we looked at the maximum floor area and FAR under our existing standards for single family homes. So that's that gray bar at the bottom there. So you can look at for an R75 zone, you can see that um, the way we calculate our floor area leaves you at about 3923 or FAR about 0.52 on those lots. Um, and so you can see what that looks like for different lots and different zones. So when we're talking about options A, B, and C, we want to just make sure to sort of compare those to um, the maximum FAR that we would have under the existing standard because um, we want to sort of land somewhere that's consistent um, with what we have currently, at least in terms of the amount of square footage. So when we look at different options, we have sort of a range between 1,000 square feet and 1,800 square feet that the city could require for um, square footage in a cottage cluster unit. So option A would be the smallest, that 1,000 square feet option. We looked at, you know, an R75, R10, and R15, what, um, you know, a thousand square foot unit um, with a five unit cottage cluster development, what a thousand square foot per unit restriction would look like. And so you can see that you get FARs, at least for the R75 zone that are a bit higher than the um, sort of 0.52 that you'd be allowed to build with, it was just a single family home based on this sort of limitation based on the cottage cluster unit size. You still get a little bit more FAR for a five unit development um, if you were to go with that 1,000 square foot option. Um, and you can see sort of, if you were to go up for an R75 zone and or and allow sort of 1,200 square foot cottage cluster units or 1,800 square foot cottage cluster units that you'd be getting um, pretty significantly over what we would allow currently in terms of floor area on these lots. So, you know, we're really looking at which option would make the most sense in which zone, more or less with this question. So we don't necessarily have to say all cottage clusters have a unit of 1,000, or a unit size, a maximum of 1,000 square feet. Um, we could say that applies in R75, but, you know, maybe we should apply something different in R10. So we do have a little bit of flexibility there. Um, but I thought this was a good table, and there's also a... Uh, graph that we've developed that will help sort of point this out a little bit more. And you, you can see when it comes to the R75 zone, um, clearly that thousand square foot per unit is as close as we're going to get to um, the existing FAR for single family. Um, in some of the other zones, you can see that maybe 1200 square foot per unit would be appropriate. You get a little bit um, less um, than the FAR for um, the R10 and R15 zones if you're to require that 1,000 square feet per unit. So it might make sense to go up to 1,200 square feet per unit in just the R10 and R15 zones to keep it consistent. So just to look at what this looks like in sort of massing axonometric um, form here, you can see you know, that maximum building height of 24 feet or two stories, um, all the setbacks applied, the sort of uh, courtyard width what that would look like for the option that would be 1,000 square foot or you know, sort of smaller uh, unit cottage clusters. Know that this is that same lot, the 120 by 100 lot. So this is likely an R10 um, type of lot here, but it's just for illustrative purposes. And then you can compare that to the larger sort of unit concept, 1,800 square feet, where you can fit um, fewer 
units. You can do six on the sort of with the smaller units if you're required to do that. Um, but you could, if you did not have that requirement, you might have fewer units. Um, we still have that sort of minimum of five, but you can see that they are larger. So they're 1800 square feet, but they would still sort of comply with all the other regulations. So, um, you know, it's a lot to consider, but, um, you know, this is kind of something where we're looking for your input. Um, you know, we think that in general, we've heard a lot of input from the city council, from the uh, general public, that we should be limiting the floor area of the you know, individual dwelling units in a cottage cluster. Um, some of the reasons there are because it might incentivize smaller units, which are typically more affordable. It might be a little bit more consistent with neighborhood character. And, um, you know, I think when it comes to some of the reasons that um, you know, the limiting might not be uh, desirable for some folks, it would, um, you know, I think it would create a little bit less flexibility for cottage cluster projects. So again, it would be um, something that would not allow as much flexibility. Um, so that's something that we wanted to promote. So staff's recommendation here, and this is a little bit different than what's in the staff report. So I just wanted to clarify it. Um, the maximum floor area, again, we, we do recommend limiting the size of cottage cluster units. Um, we think that that 1,000 square foot minimum, uh, or I'm sorry, the maximum uh, average floor area for cottage clusters would be appropriate um, in basically medium to high density zones. So that we wanna clarify that we think that that's appropriate in the R75 district as well, um, as well as R6, R5, RDD, R3, R2, R0, and RW. Again, that's kind of the minimum that we're allowed to do when it comes to our maximum average floor area. So that's the minimum that we can do from the state's perspective. Um, otherwise, we think that something closer to 1,200 square feet might be a little bit more appropriate for R10 and R15 districts just to make sure that things are relatively consistent with existing floor area standards. Um, so that's really kind of what our largest, um, you know, I guess, analysis lens was here was just kind of thinking about what would be the most comparable to our existing floor area standards for single family. Um, so I guess, you know, with that, I'll ask the planning commission if they have any input before we bring this to public hearing on the maximum average floor area for cottage cluster unit. Well, Eric, just a question. Uh, in the second bullet there, like the first one, I think makes sense, a thousand square foot for, you know, those uh, smaller uh, zones. Uh, but then in the second bullet, I, I thought in, in the earlier slides in the table, it was a discrete value like 1,200 or 1,400. And then here in the second bullet, it's now giving a range of 1,200 to 1,400. So is the commission going to say that, you know, we like that as an option in a range of 1,200 to 400 for the R10 and R15? Or should, we, should the commission be looking at, you know, 1,200 for R10 and R15 or a separate option would be 1400 for our 10 and our 15. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we're, we're pointing out that there's um, some room to, to wiggle there, but I think 1200 might be the most, the, you know, that would be our current recommendation. So we could use some guidance from the planning commission as to what sort of side of that spectrum you prefer, 1200 or 400 sort of side. Um, but yeah, I think we're open to input on, on any of these. That is, um, something where we're, you know, we're open to input. We're not necessarily set to 1200 or 1400. Okay. So, sure. Know, so. I think we're also looking for some input on this uh, notion of averaging. So it wouldn't be a minimum or excuse me, it wouldn't be a maximum floor area for each unit. It would be an average uh, floor area uh, across all the units in, in the cottage cluster development. So, you know, you, if the minimum is a thousand square feet average, you could have a number of units that are less and some that are more, as long as the average is no actually, more than a Actually, thousand. it sounds very similar to how planned unit developments are done too, I think. They right. average the floor, not the individual yeah. homes right. in them. Yeah, we okay. thought that that would, that would promote more variety and potentially more affordable units and a, more of a mixed uh, income. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the clarification. Commissioner Stewart? I remember, I remember reading there was also a a garage ex exemption in terms of factoring the square footage. Can you speak to that? 
Um, so essentially the way that we calculate for, you know, for single family units would be, um, you know, includes an additional amount of square footage depending on the zone for a garage. Um, so we included that in our square, square footage calculations for um, single family residences and the maximum FAR. We assumed that they had garages, which meant that they had a little bit more square footage than they would if they did not have a garage. Um, otherwise, um, you know, we're not proposing something similar um, in terms of additional floor area for garages for a cottage cluster. Okay, so just to clarify, what we're considering here would include the square footage of garages. Or yes. Okay. Yes. I, I thought the state rule um, provided some allowance of uh, for garages I as well. Was like two hundred feet or something. Yeah. Maybe. Oh yeah. That? I think I think that most of them are actually. Um, it's supposed to be sort of assuming parking outside in a lot of the models that we're using, but I think um, that's something I can work to clarify. I'm sorry if I got that one wrong there, Scott. Are you saying that there's 200 square feet that's allowed for a garage in addition to this unit size? Yeah, so so in, on page six of the staff report down in the footnote, there's it talks about that. So that, that was the reason for my question. Right, and that's, that was my understanding is that we just wanted to clarify that we did include garages for this, the single family um, sort of maximum floor area uh, calculation. Okay, thank you. Maybe I misunderstood. I thought that 200 square feet allowance was also afforded to cottage clusters under the state rules, but maybe that's not the case. Okay. Um, Rachel? I know we have Rachel from Cascadia Partners here. Maybe she can um, clarify this for us while she's, if, if she can at least. Sure. I think um, what the planning commissioner was referencing is the footnote, which states that the city may exempt up to 200 square feet um, for an attached garage and that detached garages can't be included in the calculation of footprint. So there's some discretion there additionally. Um, so you may want to touch on that as part of your hearings process or not, but we can certainly do more research there if it's um, desired. Yeah, apologies. I was thinking of a different footnote. So yeah, I think there is, you know, I guess, can you clarify whether or not you did include that in the um, sort of modeling and the table calculations that you did though, Rachel? So just to clarify, um, you are correct that the garage was included in the single family FAR calculation, but not in the cottage unit calculation. Okay. And again, I think that was based on the assumption that these parking, parking for a cottage cluster unit would be um, sort of located like we've seen it in the um, massings here, which is um, surface parking. Yeah, typically cottage clusters don't have attached garages as part of the units. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to uh, the Zoom meeting, Vice Chair Pepe. Before we go, uh, if you can stay on that slide. <clears throat> so this is also going off of the premise that the minimum is two stories, is that correct? Mm, uh, so it's the maximum. Oh, can, can you go back to the other two stories? Can you go forward to, to the previous, the other slide? Can't require. The, the, the next one, the one where it had uh, 12 to 1400 for, yeah, that, this one. So are we saying that a thousand square feet, medium high density, that's a two story structure it would have to be a two-story structure because there's a 900 square foot um you know sort of minimum or i'm sorry maximum building footprint so if you're gonna have a, a thousand square feet you need to have two two stories to fit it right i just want to make i just want to make sure that that's what we're talking about here that this thousand square feet is going to be either 900 on the main floor and 100 square foot loft with 20, you know, with 18 foot high ceiling there. 
I guess I'm I'm a little lost at why we're looking at just a thousand square feet medium high density zones if it's going to be two stories. It seems odd. So I you know I think when you're talking about you know can they be two story units? Um, they they certainly can be two story units. They could be like a two five hundred foot you know five hundred square foot floors where it wouldn't necessarily be. Um, you know, that 900, 100 uh, configuration. So that would still um, be allowed, um, but it would be, you know, something where it would be a, a smaller, it would, it would be a limitation on that that would not allow you to build um, two 900 square foot floors, right? Well, yeah, no, that makes sense because you'd be over by 800, right? But I, it just seems odd that, I mean, I can see the 1200 and the 1400 in the R10, but to me, it just seems odd. That's all. In that it seems low? Yeah. Okay. You, you know, 500 square foot on a main floor, then you put a staircase in there to get to the second but, floor. But Vice Chair Pepe, sorry to interrupt you, but as Director oh. Siegel had just pointed out, it's an average floor area of all the dwellings. So, you know, each dwelling doesn't have to add up to a thousand. I mean, so, you know, you can, you can have one dwelling, 900, another one, you know, uh, much larger than that, and you're just averaging it out to be a thousand over all of the dwellings. So I, I guess that was, I guess my understanding was that we were, that was something we were also going to be giving direction on whether it should be per unit or on average. Oh, yeah, it is. And that, that scenario would, you could have a, a number of single story cottages yes. that are lower square footage and some that are two story and that are 1200 or 1400 square feet averaging it out. So it is a policy question for the commission. Okay, so so the so the the mandate isn't that each cottage cluster is two stories. No, no, it's that we cannot limit cottage. We cannot limit the units to anything less than two stories. So we cannot say that cottage cluster units must be one story, or must cannot exceed one and a half stories. We're not permitted to do that. But the square footage maximum could make it almost feasibly impossible to make it two stories it could make it difficult it could make it could yeah. gotcha. encourage more of a one and a half story configuration yeah thank you yeah. you could do that sort of like 500 and 500 configuration i'm not sure it makes the most sense i'm sure that you'd want a little bit more square footage on that bottom floor um so yeah it, it might it might result in uh units that are less marketable perhaps or at least if they're two stories, sort of evenly units, they would be less marketable in that scenario. I will keep uh, moving, uh, Commissioner Rigby. Um, when we're looking at the direction of the city council, and if I remember correctly, the um, advisory uh, committee to uh, be in minimum compliance with uh, the state requirements it seems to me that trying to uh, take the approach that the staff has gone for to approximate the lot coverage uh, or the, the square footage that would be um, allowed under the current rules uh, would be desirable. And um, it, am I correct, Eric, in saying that would be uh, 1,000, 1,000, and 1,200? Would you be able to go back to the, the chart for the uh, yeah. Sure. So what we are recommending right now on this chart would be 1,000 for R75 and 1,200 for R10 and R15. And again, this is kind of an average that we propose as our recommendation. Um, so we wouldn't want it to be less than what we would allow for the existing uh, single family units. Um, but we wouldn't want it to be, um, you know, too far over, you know, particularly when it comes to this scenario where it could be double that they are. Okay. I mean, while it may be, you know, marginally less, um, you know, option A on R10 is closer. Um, so I... I'm not sure whether uh, I think that option A or B would be preferable for R10, but I, I, I think staff's approach is the right way to go. Uh, Commissioner Lee. 
Well, I kind of disagree. I think that um, uh, the 1,000 square feet should be more, maybe 1,100 square feet, give it some more. And the other option should be more than 1,400 square feet, 15. Um, the economy of the build, the square footage that would be marketable. I mean, if your sewer hookup's gonna cost the same, and so is the water line. <laughs> no. So um, if you can go up and you're still gonna be, you know, have development codes that say your outside has to have fenestration that looks like this and the roof line can only be whatever. Um, I think the design part will, will make them just a little bit bigger and more appealing. Thank you, Commissioner Lee, Commissioner Buchanan. Eric, I just wanted to check my thinking on something. So in looking at this diagram uh, on this slide we have here and thinking about our 7.5 over an acre, um, I know we can have a maximum on the cottage cluster, but with that land, if you were to subdivide it, it, it what I'm <laughs> calculating out is that you could have 28 cottages on one acre if it was R 7.5, is that correct? Um, I would have to do the calculations on an acre, but yeah, I mean, so we have 4,000 or 43.5, right, for an acre roughly and however many times you can do seven and a half into that. Um, so let's just say, uh, yeah, eight. So, you know, again, this is, uh, if we're talking about something that's eight times, um, you know, it, it, we're not talking about eight different units. We're talking about eight times the minimum lot size of an R75 zone. So you would be able to, um, you know, just to, uh, I think I might be getting a little bit off track here, but if you're talking about the sort of density provisions, um, you, know, you can imagine that five units on a, a site that is um, one eighth of an acre, having five units on a size that's a site that's one eighth of an acre would easily meet the minimum density of four dwelling units or four cottage cluster units per acre. If that is what you're asking, I'm sorry if I'm mis misinterpreting. Yes, thank you. Wow. All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions from commissioners. Uh, so should we make a recommendation on the option to go forward? Uh, Eric, would you like to go to the uh, staff recommendation slide? Sure. And again, this is kind of, you know, we're talking about a few different variables here. So, um, you know, really uh, what we're talking about um, averages versus just a straight maximum floor area for all of the cottage clusters. Um, so should we do this as an average is one question. And then, you know, what is the appropriate maximum size for a cottage cluster unit is the other. All right. Well, maybe let's try to take it. I know they're somewhat connected, but let's try to take them independently. Uh, so commissioners are uh, um, doing a discrete uh, square foot size versus an average size. Any recommendations? Uh, for that, I just go through uh, Vice Chair Pepe. Yeah, I, I would recommend that it that it be an average. Thank you, Commissioner Phillips. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand the thousand square feet and twelve hundred, and you're going to mark through that fourteen hundred uh, in the R ten and fifteen. Is that correct? So yes, that's the recommendation. That is what uh, we're we're recommending. Okay. Uh, because of the averaging, I think that makes sense. I take uh, 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 Commissioner Leake's uh, point, but I think the goal here is to uh, have more uh, affordable and uh, houses in the area. And I think this would probably create a few more, but it would also allow some of those areas to be larger, some of the units to be larger and some smaller, which gives more families and more people an opportunity to afford what they can and still increase the numbers. So I, I agree with your staff recommendation. Uh, we're going through it kind of sequentially here. So it was average or discrete value. So I think uh, if you're um, aligning on the staff recommendation, then you're aligning on an average and we'll come to the sizes next. Uh, Commissioner Lee, on average or? I'll go with average. Commissioner Rigby. 
Um, I don't have an opinion. Okay. Commissioner Stewart? Average. Commissioner Buchanan? Average. Yeah, it'd be for average too. So I think uh, the commission finds uh, that uh, you know using an average calculation would be the desirable way to go. And then the second question is more to the uh, square footage uh, sizes than based on the average uh, in the zones. Um, I, I tend to sense that there is some good agreement uh, uh, on what the staff recommendation uh, is. Uh, so I'll ask, um, would the commissioners like to uh, request a different option than what staff has uh, here from the sizes mapping to the zones? Uh, I'll, and I'll start on the Zoom. Commissioner Pepe, are you okay with staff's recommendation or would like a change? Uh, no, can you, can, Eric, can you please clarify the 12 to 1400? Is the 12 going to R10 and the 1400 to R15? Uh, so I'm sorry for the confusion on the slide here. This We're kind of putting forward a range, but I think um, our, our actual recommendation would be 1200 if we wanted to sort of keep it consistent with um, the existing um, FAR for single family. So R10 and R15. Both R10 and R15, 1200. Yes. 1200. Okay, yeah. Right. I agree. Uh, all right, thank you, Vice Chair Pepe. Commissioner Phillips? I, I agree with that, 1,000 and 1,200. Commissioner Lee? Um, I disagree. I think it should be 1,100, and it should be a minimum of 1,300 in R10 and R15. May I ask a question, Chair sure. Heath? I'm really I'm interested in learning more about um, your uh, idea around that commissioner leak is it is it to try to align um, the unit sizes more closely with the existing floor area limits of the zones or is there or, or is it for another reason i just i'm interested no it's more. my gut feeling having been a realtor for 34 years how this pencils out and been in, being in the building business for 20 of those years none of this pencils out Okay, so Unless you give me more square footage, okay. this is a this is a pipe dream. We're okay. doing an exercise in dreaming. Okay. Thank you. Market feasibility. Commissioner Rigby. Uh, my view here would be that uh, our task is not to create marketable cottage clusters or um, you know desirable ones even, but to be in minimum compliance with the rules brought down upon the city by the state. That's what the city council has, uh, says is their, is their goal in this process. And to that end, I think making, uh, making the, the square footage be closest to the maximum floor area standards would be best. Um, it sounds like the recommendation here is is not literally most comparable, judging by what we were talking about at my former comment. So my recommendation would be to make it um, the most mathematically close, which I believe would place R10 in the thousand square foot range. Okay, okay thanks, uh, Commissioner Rigby. Commissioner Stewart. Unfortunately, I don't have really good direction on this other than to say that I'm in favor of having a variable average square footage between the smaller zones and the larger zones like staff is recommending here. I, I could support both staff's recommendation or Commissioner Leak's idea of going a little bit higher. I'm just not real settled on what that those numbers need to be. So all I'll say at this point is that I'm supportive of having two different averages. Thank you, Commissioner Buchanan. Uh, honestly, I'm um, in line with what it is that uh, Commissioner Seward is thinking and Commissioner Leak, and maybe, you know, continued conversation about this. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's a... It's interesting working in real estate, as does Commissioner Leak, and, and thinking about contractors and developers. They typically will find a way to develop. And so, you know, your point, Commissioner Rigby, is really well taken. And <laughs> it, 
it becomes a question of, you know, not in my backyard or, you know, do we create Lake Oswego as being a more accessible place? Um, and that being said, contractor developers extrapolate whatever it is you put in front of them to maximize their dollar figure. Um, so uh, I think regardless of what it is that we put together, <laughs> they're going to try and weave a way in which they can, they can max out you know, profit. Can I just say in addition, I agree with what you say about minimum requirements. and We should just follow that law or the, the direction. So I'm good with that. I guess it just sticks in my craw because it, it doesn't become a reality, but <clears throat> we need to stay to the, stay to the mandate. All right. Um, I was going to say, I do have some experience with the cottage clusters even before House Bill 2001 came up. You know, I was looking at it in Josephine County, and um, we had some discussions earlier just on what would we like to do for affordable housing and what it meant in Lake Oswego. And I kind of echo some of your concerns that you have, uh, Commissioner Lee, that, you know, when you start getting down to around 1,000 square foot, and even from, from a consumer's standpoint, you start looking at the price of the home and stuff, and it's kind of high for that small square footage. It's just don't see it. The cottage clusters were kind of hard to, uh, you know, uh, accept. And so I, I think it's a great point is whether they're realistic and whether they'll have any marketability to them. Uh, but um, I, I think, again, as we're looking at this, uh, I think staffs framed the options fairly well here. I, I think uh, this will be one we'll have to take a lot of public input on, uh, and we may have to adjust it and fine tune it based on the public input that we get. I think some of the concerns that are being raised we'll, we'll hear uh, when we go to the public hearing. Uh, so I'm in favor of staff's recommendation. Uh, Vice Chair Pepe, you'd like to make another comment? Yeah, sorry. Just Remember, we're just talking about cottage clusters, and this is not the only option for um, bringing in affordable housing. So if it doesn't work in a specific lot or in a specific area, more than likely something else will. Just something to keep in mind. Sure, thank you, Vice Chair Pepe. Uh, so I think what I've heard is that the commission would recommend going with uh, the uh, staff recommended options. You know, uh, the uh, average uh, floor area, uh, the R7.5 at uh, 1,000, and then the R10 and R15 at uh, I want, to, I want to say 1,200, or should we leave it at the range? Does the commission feel at the range of 1,200 to 1,400? Seems like a range of 1,200 to 1,400, exactly how, how staff has it stated. I think either one would be fine with me, just, just a number that's different than the 1,000. Sure. Just to propose. So, all right, then our recommendation is to go with the uh, exact recommendation that uh, staff has uh, then here in the report. Commissioners, all in agreement? Yes? Yep. Right. At least for now. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, that's that's helpful. And I, yeah, I appreciate your understanding that this is kind of a dynamic issue where it's hard to hard to know the exact sort of balance of strike. So um, yeah, I think uh, at least we'll, we'll put this out there and see what kind of feedback we get. So moving forward to design standards, this will be the last thing that I'll cover tonight. So I know we've been here a while, so I'll try to make it relatively quick. Um, you know, when it comes to design standards, we have some options. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we, um, you know, we, we do have obviously a lot that's in the model code as well that would help for, um, you know, setting up some design standards that would be specifically catered towards cottage cluster types of developments. So, um, you know, when it comes to these design standards, you know, we kind of, you know, if we're going to, to comply with the minimum compliance track, um, we would either apply essentially what's in the DLCD model code, the design standards that are, that are in the model code, or a less restrictive version of those design standards. So I'll just talk really quickly about what's in the model code. You know, I think for the most part, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, folks in the city who didn't necessarily want to take the track of just adopting the model code and we want to do our own thing in Lake Oswego. Um, but when it comes to the options 
for cottage clusters, we're finding that what's in the model code is actually um, the most desirable option in this case because of just the way that our sort of rulemaking um, has been set for, for this particular type of middle housing. Um, so again, we're supposed to go with this model code or something less restrictive, and we think that you know, essentially this is um, fairly, fairly decent and that we should probably go with some of the, the standards in the model code. Um, so including um, common courtyard standards. So touched upon those a uh, little bit ago, um, we we're talking about dimensional standards, but essentially this is just talking a little bit more about the courtyard. So the minimum size of the courtyard is 150 square feet per cottage. It can't be less than 15 feet wide. Um, and a minimum of 50% of the cottages in development must have their main entrance face the courtyard and be within 10 feet of the courtyard. So that's all what's in the model code. Uh, we think that's pretty good. We, we wouldn't wanna decrease those restrictions because we think that that um, provides a little bit more um, sort of logic to these developments and they do have sort of relaxed setbacks and things like that. So we think that we can rely a little bit more on these to get a good design outcome. Um, they also have some pedestrian access standards. So an accessible pedestrian path must um, connect the main entrance of each cottage to the common courtyard, the parking area, community buildings, if they have any, as well as walkways putting the site. And there's some standards related to windows as well, that cottages within 20 feet of a street must meet any window coverage standards of the base zone. So, um, you know, we have some consistency with what we have in our code currently, depending on the district. When it comes to parking, there's another sort of section talking a little bit about the design standards for parking in the model code, DLC's model code. So you can't locate um, surface parking lot um, between, uh, essentially you can't locate it between a cottage cluster and the street. Um, you also have to locate it within, um, or at least further back than 20 feet from the street. So more than 20 feet from the street and you can't sort of do it in front, have your parking in front of the cottage cluster unit. Um, you also have to cluster your parking in addition to your, your cottages um, into separate sort of smaller lots of up to five spaces. So there's a cluster in five space sort of um, configurations as well. Um, and you have to separate um, that surface parking from the street um, with landscaping. So that's also required um, under the DLC model code. So again, we're wanting to go through and, and implement these because our only other options would be less restrictive and we think this is um, a good option considering those circumstances. And when it comes to other standards that are in our code that aren't in the DLC model code, we do have some flexibility there as well. Um, so essentially, you know, all the building design standards that currently apply to single family houses could also be applied to um, cottage cluster development. So again, this is building design specifically, not necessarily the dimensional standards, um, but those are you know, regulations that include landscaping, um, you know, we've mentioned that below as well. There are some landscaping related standards that I just talked to you about that would be included in the model code, um, but otherwise landscaping standards in our code currently, the design standards for the latest landscaping could also apply to cottage clusters. Um, and generally speaking, design standards that apply to single family houses in the overlay and design districts could continue to apply, but I would, uh, stipulate that, you know, that's specific to design standards, not necessarily dimensional standards. Again, the dimensional standards for cottage clusters, especially the setbacks, um, would continue to supersede other things. So when it comes to just our recommendations here, we have less um, options that we're asking you to consider because there are, you know, fairly limited options other than when it comes to the sort of additional design standards in the code um, that would apply to um, cottage clusters as long as they don't conflict with the model code. So our recommendation is to more or less just apply um, all the design standards in the model code for cottage cluster housing to cottage clusters in Lake Oswego. And also on top of that, apply any design standards that apply to single family housing to cottage cluster housing as long as they don't conflict with the model code, which is not allowed um, pursuant to DLCD. So um, yeah, that, that's within the, the sort of minimum requirement track. Um, we think that's the best way to accomplish it, but if you have any other input here, we would love to hear it. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Uh, Vice Chair Pepe? Yeah, just 
I'm pretty sure I know the answer to the question being yes, but just to clarify, regarding the landscaping and the upkeep and whatnot, these cottage clusters are going to have their own homeowners associations, correct? That are going to pay for the upkeep and maintenance of the grounds? They would have to have their own arrangement of some type. Yeah, it would be a common ownership of either the common space or the entire lot. Um, so okay. there would be, yeah, there would be a separate entity that would control it. Thank you. Commissioner, any other questions? Commissioner Lee? Can you tell me where these two cottage clusters are, the one in the photo here and the one that precedes it? I don't know. You know, Rachel, do you know off the top of your head? I think we've used these. Um, I am not sure. <laughs> um, we can get clarification on that. I know. Yeah, we can look into that. I know Jamin provided us with these images, so you would know a little bit more, I'm sure. It's, it's somewhere near a lot of boats. Very nice cottage clusters, big brick chimneys. No one does that anymore. Well, those are connected oh, units it's on the computer generated. Side. Oh, computer generated. Okay, never mind. That was my question. <laughs> um, I think there is actually minimum separation between um, you know the units that would meet the, the definition there. Um, if the commission's interested, we can provide a list of cottage cluster communities within our region there there are a number of them all the way up in the columbia river gorge and in the portland area as well on puget sound so there, there's some examples out there if you're interested there's one just up the street in tigard across from washington square coral the coral clusters and they're adorable yeah we were just trying to not include an image of trillium woods in this uh presentation today so i think we've at least accomplished that hopefully it's not a cottage cluster it's probably Right. So back to the recommendations then, are we okay with the staff's recommendation on the options? Uh, Commissioner Phillips? Uh, yes, I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm still, I'm not sure I understand whether it's 1200 or 12 to 1400, there's been discussion, but I, yes. yes, I'm in favor. All right, thank you. This, this, again, this is specifically on the design standards. Uh, for cottage clusters. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm fine with the. Yeah. Uh, commissioners, anybody wish to? Uh, Commissioner Rigby? Uh, just to clarify, this, I, is the staff recommendation to apply single family design standards? Um, so as long again, as they do not conflict? Yes, yes. So that's what, we, that's what we mean when we say any design standards that apply to single family housing. Um, in addition to the model code um, standards that you know govern things that we don't currently regulate in our single family home because we don't have the type of configurations that you see with the cottage cluster. Right. I'm on board with that. Yeah, I agree. Not hearing any opposition and commission finds the, the, the options set forth on the design standards by staff that are acceptable and recommended by the commission. Yeah, I've, I've got just oh, I've gen Stewart, generally, too. yeah, sorry. Generally, I, I'm, I'm in favor of staff's recommendation. There's a couple landscape minimums I'm a little uncomfortable with. Um, I don't know where our flexibility is on the 15 foot wide minimum courtyard. I think the diagrams are a little misleading because if we have two story houses primarily in a 15 foot courtyard, that's going to feel kind of a 15 foot wide minimum courtyard. If somebody elects to build it like that, that's going to be rather, I mean, actually go back to that last picture, the one you just, nice. the one with the big houses by the boats. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there you go. So the, Behind that uh, comment there, yeah, you see how dark that courtyard is? That's that's my what I'm afraid of, and I know these houses are much bigger than what we're talking about, but that could be an unintended consequence. So well, that's just taller, and this is even wider than right, right. 15, yeah, 15 foot is like from here to that wall. I mean, no, well, well, there's 150 square foot minimum, but it also is saying a 15 foot minimum width. Yeah, we just to clarify on that, we we don't have um, the ability to change that regulation for cottage clusters, or we could say less than fifteen feet. Well, hopefully they'll build it bigger. I guess um, yeah, that, that's it. Um, but generally, yes, I'm in favor of it. 
Great, thank you. I think then the uh, commission finds uh, the options that again staff set forth for the design standards for cottage clusters are, are recommended. So please go with those options. Great, thank you. Um, and that wraps up my portion of uh, the agenda tonight. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Eric will be back for one more round on the 14th of February, right, Eric? And what, what are we covering on the 14th? Yeah, we have a, a meeting at City Council on the 15th, but we're covering um, on the 14th, we'll be essentially wrapping up um, some of these remaining items, as well as just kind of presenting the full package of what we're talking about and what that might look like in terms of the code amendments. So just trying to really fine tuning things and talking about things that just are remaining items that we need to take care of before we put out that public review draft. All right, thank you. Oh, so if we're finished, we'll move on to the next agenda item, other business. Any other business? Didn't have any? Not from staff. All right, schedule review, Director Siegel. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, Senior Planner Olson provided half of the schedule update or schedule review, so thank you for that, Eric. Um, so your next regular, regular meeting is on the 14th. Uh, you also have the findings from the hearing on the annual code amendments you heard this evening. Um, the next meeting, which you, uh, which I believe you're invited and you're welcome to attend, is the, uh, the meeting of the City Council on the 15th. We'll be holding a study session just to get an update on, uh, on our progress, all of the work that you've been doing on middle housing for the past uh, four, it'll be the past four meetings. And then I wanted to ask uh, or suggest a schedule of refinement. We had uh, initially, I think we had anticipated a an update of some kind or a work session on, I'm looking at the calendar here, February 28th on an economic development. And what I'm gonna propose is that rather than taking that up at that time that uh, with the chair's uh, concurrence that so we would wait until after the city council goal setting because I, I would anticipate that if we're going to be taking that up that they would be taking it up at their goal, goal setting and provide some direction and instead uh, come back in March, uh, the, be the first meeting in March to have a work session with the Planning Commission on that and any other goals uh, for direction that come from the council so that we can update our work program and get uh, feedback from the commission on how to prioritize our work uh, this year. So uh, that would be, that would follow their goal setting, which is scheduled for uh, middle of February. And, and then at the end of the month, um, on the 28th, instead of having that discussion about economic development, uh, we would like to bring a, a work session topic to you on the city's current policy and code regulating demolitions and how that um, relates to our standards for non-conforming development. And this is, uh, this was an action item that came out of the Middle Housing Advisory Committee um, that the council wanted the Planning Commission and, and, and the council themselves to consider as part of the Middle Housing Amendment so that um, that's what I would propose, Chair Heap, that on the 28th that we would um, have a work session on that topic so that we can align that work with, with everything else that you're doing on Middle Housing. And then, uh, of course, the next, the next series of meetings in April uh, or March is fairly light. Uh, the only item that's scheduled so far in, in March is tentatively a, a work session with the Lake Grove Business Association to discuss their work on uh, the Lake Grove and West Lake Grove design standards. Um, and then that would lead into uh, public hearings in April on middle housing. So that's, that's sort of the sequence of, of uh, projects that is coming up and, and then with the caveat around uh, new council goals. Thank you, Director Siegel. I think that sounds fine as far as the changes. You did remind me of one thing I wanted to bring up. Uh, so since our last meeting, uh, we did have the Boards and Commissions Summit, which I know many of the commissioners here attended. And um, I did get um, an ask that came from the HREB uh, chair, uh, and you reminded me of that, it was related to demolition. He was actually asking if there was a way that we could better coordinate and inform the HREB uh, 
commission uh, when there's going to be demolitions done. And so I'd say we can certainly see if it fits within the scope and talk with staff about that. And so I'd ask if maybe staff can take a look at that and see if there's maybe something we can study. And I don't know if it would fit in with what you're describing for looking at uh, demolitions. Uh, I know you're mentioning the context of affordable housing, but maybe this could fit in too if it's within the scope of the plan commission. Yeah, so be happy to uh, cover sort of the you know the current policy and, and procedures that we have around demolitions when we talk about that because there's some some parts of that that are regulatory like the the public notice that goes up for a cur as a courtesy to neighbors to let people know that a, a demolition is coming and uh, there are other you know other aspects of that that uh, are more. I guess they're they're relating to the building permit process and you know when uh, someone is able to maintain their non-conforming setbacks or or um, you know when when a project is considered a demolition rather than a remodel and then there's some other uh, per, you know procedures that we have in place that are that are more administrative that are not uh, part of that land use process where uh, having you know worked with the historic resources advisory board and the Preservation Society uh, was a few years ago now, and we uh, developed a procedure where uh, the library is collaborating with uh, preservation um, advocates to document buildings, to take photos of the buildings before they're removed so that okay. we have a record. So there are other pieces of, of this that I'd be happy to brief the, sure. you know, the Planning Commission on it so you have a complete picture of what we're doing. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right. No comments or questions are on schedule from any of the commissioners, none? All right, thank you, uh, Director Siegel, for the schedule review. I think that's all we have for tonight. So thanks to all the commissioners and staff for staying late. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.